Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing fine today. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're doing a video testimony. Can you please tell the jury uh, where we are right now? We're in Melbourne, Australia. Um, this is a hotel. We're in a meeting room in the hotel. Um, cameras, lawyers, staffers. And, sir, why are we in Melbourne right now? Uh, I guess you're here because you want to uh, hear my testimony in this case. Um, I was supposed to be in San Francisco for the case. My wife and I came to Australia. She's on a sabbatical from the University of Bern uh, for five months. Um, and um, while we were here, I was in the gym, had a um, cardiac arrest, collapsed on the floor. Um, I was very lucky. There were people there who knew what they were doing. Um, taken to the hospital. Uh, I spent a week in the hospital recovering. They um, put a pacemaker and an automatic defibrillator in my chest um, to kick start my heart next time it stops. Um, I'm really not in a position to travel all the way back to San Francisco at this time because of this health concern. Um, and I, that's why you're here, I believe. Well, sir, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming, and I do appreciate the defense's um, coming. Um, could you please state your full name and do introduce yourself to the jury? Uh, my name is Christopher Jude Portier. Um, I currently live in Switzerland. I'm a citizen of the United States. Um, what more do you want to know? You know what? We'll get into it uh, directly. Let's start off with your educational okay. background. Uh, Where would you go to college? Uh, I went to a little college in uh, Louisiana called Nichols State University. Uh, it was about 40 miles from my hometown. Uh, from there, I went to graduate school at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, my undergraduate degree was mathematics, and my graduate degree was in biostatistics with a minor in epidemiology. And following your, your uh, PhD, well, when you were at UNC, uh, what did you focus on in your PhD? Um, my PhD was on the optimal design and analysis for two-year animal cancer bioassays. These are studies done in animals to look at um, uh, chemicals that might cause cancer in the animals. It was finding the design that worked best for um, um, evaluating the studies. Was that what your dissertation was about? That's what my dissertation was about. Um, and, your, and your work looking at the optimal design, um, how has that impacted the way we look at animal studies today? Well, the National Toxicology Program still uses that particular design in all of their bioassays, um, and most people use variations on that particular design. Um, it, it's a good practical guide. And sir, just to give the jury a sense, what drew you to this area of science? Why did you want to look at animal studies? Um, well, to be honest, when I was in graduate school, um, I had a daughter and a wife that I had to support, and the, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences needed somebody to look at their cancer bioassay and find a way to create an optimal design for them so that they used, they were most efficient in the use of animals uh, and at the same time got the most information out of it. Uh, they offered me part-time employment to work on it as my PhD thesis. It was a great opportunity for me. Um, following your PhD, uh, where did you begin working? Uh, the Nas National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which I'll just call NIEHS now. Um, NIEHS offered me a job to stay there after I got my PhD um, to work with them and with the National Toxicology <coughs> Program which is physically in the same building and managed by the same um, organization. And so I took that position. Can you please explain to the jury what, what are these various institutions? How do they fit within our sort of scientific umbrella in the US? Um, so in environmental issues in the United States, you have, um, let's just say there are four major players. The Environmental Protection Agency, which is the regulatory authority, they um, um, interpret the laws and set standards and make sure that uh, companies follow those standards that they set. The um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 
Uh, does public health outlook? They try to find ways to prevent lead poisoning, prevent um, asthma attacks. Um, so their job is to get out into the public and, and improve public health. The FDA is uh, in charge of food and the quality of food. And then the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is the research arm. They're part of the National Institutes of Health. They fund research in the NIHS, about 10% of their budget, but then about 90% of their budget is sent out to um, researchers at universities around the, the country through competitive grants to look at environmental health hazards in the population. They're also the home of the U.S. National Toxicology Program. It's the world's largest toxicology program. Their job is, on behalf of the federal agencies, to do studies to look at the impact of chemicals, the potential impact of chemicals on people, and most of that work is done in laboratories, either using human cells uh, or animal cells or animals themselves. Now, when you finished your PhD and you started at the NIEHS uh, and the NTP, National Toxicology Program, um, what did you do? Well, when I first started out, I did the same thing I basically did as a graduate student. I did research into better ways to analyze and interpret uh, laboratory studies. So I continued to do a lot of work on cancer bioassays. Um, came up with a method to analyze the data from a cancer bioassay that the National Toxicology Program is still using today, as well as many other authorities. We did work on reproductive toxicology, developmental toxicology, so how, how um, infants develop through their life and how chemicals might affect that. Um, immunological changes that chemicals might cause. So I continue to do that type of work. Uh, eventually, I stepped away from that work and became much more interested in the laboratory work itself um, and how the mechanisms of carcinogenesis work. And I spent a lot of time working with laboratories on how we might interpret that, better ways to create um, uh, things on the computer that can help us interpret it better. Uh, after a while, I started my own laboratory doing my own research, so I had actually scientists who were in the lab mixing chemicals and exposing cells and things like that um, for experiments that I wanted to do. Um, after that, I went into much more administrative work, still kept my lab through my entire time at NIH, but I also did a lot of other administrative work. And. Uh while you were at the NIH, National Institute of Health, uh, what did you, did you elevate uh, in position while you were there? Well, I, I was a principal investigator from the first day that I was at um, NIEHS, and that's an independent scientific researcher within the organization. You have your own resources. You can get graduate students and um, laboratory supplies and things like that. Um, and that's the standard position for anybody who's doing science within NIH. But as time went on, went on, I also took on larger positions. I was in charge of an entire branch that did work on um, computational biology and risk assessment. Uh, then I was in charge of um, an entire division, all of the toxicology research within the NIHS was under my uh, management and control. And as well, I took over management of the National Toxicology Program for six years. Um, and then after that, I became the senior scientific advisor to the director of NIEHS. And there I worked on issues such as um, uh, starting a program for climate change and human health research at NIH. Um, starting a series of centers on children's environmental health issues across the United States, um, things like that. Um, following your time at NIH, did you work at another uh, agency? Yes, I then went on to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, where I was director of their National Center for Environmental Health. Um, that's the center that's concerned about environmental public health in the United States. So like I said earlier, they do things like 
lead poisoning prevention, asthma prevention. They measure chemicals in people's blood in the United States on a routine basis to look and see trends in chemical exposures. Are they going down? Are they going up? What should we be concerned about? Um, they have a climate change and human health program. Um, they have a number of different programs. They even inspect all the cruise lines that land in the United States. So if you ever fly, go on a cruise ship, CDC's National Center for Environmental Health has inspected that cruise ship for sanitary practices. Um, I was also director of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and that's also in Atlanta. It's also under management of the CDC, although it's not part of the CDC. So it's sort of like the National Toxicology Program in NIHS. So I had two jobs uh, running both organizations. Um, ATSDR um, concerns itself with Superfund sites. So these are toxic dump sites in the United States. And their legal responsibility is to assess the potential for health impacts in a community from those dump sites and then advise the Environmental Protection Agency on whether these sites need to be cleaned up. And then it's EPA's responsibility to clean it, to sue and get money to, for the cleanup from anybody who actually caused the problem. And then at the end, it's our job to go back and certify that it is now safe for the community. All told, how long were you working in government service uh, and public health issues? Uh, let's see, 1978 to 2013, um, 35, 36 years. And during that time, um, what percentage of your work focused on the causes of cancer? Well, at NIH, it was clearly 80, 90 percent of my work dealt with cancer, causes of cancer, and mechanisms of cancer. At, at CDC, it's a bigger public health problem, so bigger public health issues, so I spent more time with a lot of other things. And specifically when it comes to cancer or carcinogens, uh, can you give the jury some examples of some of the projects you worked on when you worked at the uh, National Toxicology Program and NIH? Sure. Um, one thing I worked on for a number of years was the um, carcinogenicity of dioxin. It's a, it's a contaminant. It's not a, a chemical that you really want to have around. It, it gets created um, accidentally in the production of certain things. Um, I spent a lot of time on trying to understand how dioxins cause cancer. We did a number of studies on um, uh, various ways to see what's going on with the cancer process from dioxins. And we also use that as a stepping stone for understanding how chemicals that interact with what are called cellular receptors um, can cause cancer in people. Let's see, what else did I do? Um, I spent time looking at the potential of power lines and electric and magnetic fields to cause cancer in children childhood leukemia. There was some literature on that subject uh, that had concerned Congress and they tasked NIH with looking at that and NIH tasked me with leading that effort. Um, I did some work on um, early cancer development in um, the brains of rats from exposure to a variety of different chemicals. And then I did one of the final things I looked at was not just cancer, but cancer was a big part of it, but sort of all human diseases, all chemicals. And the question was whether we could use um, this, this whole area called genomics and proteomics to go from uh, experiments in cells and animals and predict on a, a huge basis all human disease that they are associated with. Um, and we created this, this huge network linking about 4,000 chemicals to about 200 human diseases. Um, uh, that was a really nice project. Did you ultimately retire, sir? Yes, in 2013 I retired from... What did you do after that? Um, I spent six months working at the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, France. Uh, I was there as a senior visiting scientist. I think that's the title they use for it. Um, it's a grant uh, position. They, they bring people in every, at six months at a time to work with them. I worked on um, 
ways to evaluate mechanistic studies in uh, cancer evaluations. Uh, after that, I was working for the Environmental Defense Fund in the United States. It's a nonprofit, non-government organization. Uh, their goal is to um, uh, encourage the, the better use of science in policy decisions. Um, they, they fund a lot of scientific research and they do a lot of policy arguments and pushing for policy goals. My job there was to uh, help them design some of the studies they're doing, evaluate some of the science that they were funding, um, mostly in the area of climate change and air pollution, um, and a little bit in the area of fracking, and a little bit in the area of looking at um, human exposures to chemicals. And then I'd done some consulting work for federal, for, for governments around the country, around the world, uh, and some consulting with lawyers. Um, you mentioned uh, you, you did some, you've been doing some work with the NRDC. Um, uh, can you please, uh, has any of that work related to health issues in the Bay Area? So that's not NRDC. Oh, sorry. That's the NRDC is the National Resources Defense Council, and I have worked with them. But no, this was with the Environmental Defense Fund. Sorry. EDF. EDF. Um, and yes, they, they have, we have done work in the Bay Area. We, um, one of the very first things I did at EDF was um, meet with Google. Uh, Google has street view cars. If any of you ever go and look at um, Google's maps, you can always go down to the level where all of a sudden now you're standing on the street and looking around. Yeah. Those are cars that drive around with cameras at the top and take all these pictures. Well, we had the idea that we could put air pollution monitors on those same cars. And while they're driving around taking pictures, at the same time they'd be driving around and measuring air pollution in local communities. And we could use that to map out at the local level what air pollution looks like. Um, they agreed to work with us on that project, and we started in Oakland, and we did a, a lot of mapping and monitoring in Oakland. We, at the same time, we brought in um, a local insurance company for uh, um, Kaiser Permanente for Northern California, and we worked with them on health records of people near where this air pollution was being measured to see if we could see differences in health impacts of the air pollution at the local levels. Um, now we're doing, we've expanded that study into the entire Bay Area, so I think we're doing 14 of the cities in and around San Francisco Bay. Um, we've expanded it into Houston, metropolitan area in Texas. We've expanded it into London. We have a large project in London right now, and we're looking at expanding into two more cities in the near future. Sir, I understand you're retired. Why are you doing this work? Well. You, 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 you spend all your career figuring out how to do something. Um, you think when you first get your PhD, you know everything, but by the time you're my age, you realize that you don't know everything and you still continue to learn. Um, my passion for um, environmental health has not waned simply because I retired. Um, so I still do it because it's important. Um, it's what I spent my entire life training for. Um, the American public paid for me to learn all this stuff. I figured they should get something back from it, so I continue to work on these issues. Now, you mentioned that shortly after your retirement, you spent six months with the International Agency for Research on Cancer. You recall that? Um, is that also known as IARC? Yes. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about IARC, but just for those of us who aren't familiar, what is IARC? So the United Nations is a big organization that many, many nations belong to. And the United Nations has several underlying organizations, um, one of which is the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization's goal is to sort of improve the health of everybody on the planet. Um, and under the World Health Organizations, there are other subgroups. There's divisions that worry about infectious diseases and AIDS and non-communicable diseases. A semi-independent agency within WHO is the International Agency for Research on Cancer. 
They started out as an agency that was intended to help countries around the world develop cancer registries so they could figure out how much cancer risk there were in each of these countries. But it broadened into a research organization that does global research on cancer, as well as an organization that evaluates uh, causes of cancer and works in ways to prevent those cancers from occurring. Have you personally participated in IARC programs to evaluate whether or not things cause cancer? Oh, yes. How many times do you, do you recall? Um, seven or eight times for different um, collections of things that might cause cancer. And um, are you paid when you participate in that? No, no, it's, it's non-paid. They, they simply cover your expenses. Uh, why did you do it? Well, um, uh, most of the time I was working for the U.S. government, so it was, in essence, part of my job to participate in um, activities like that, even though I'm not representing the U.S. government when I do that. They encourage us, the NIH encouraged us to be involved in issues that are important, like the evaluation of agents that might cause cancer. Um, um, NIH also encouraged me to work on EPA's Science Advisory Board and EPA's Science uh, Advisory Panel, and I worked on an Australian Science Advisory Board for years. All right, sir. Um, now that we've kind of covered some of your background, I, I want to sort of get to why we're here today. How did you get involved with glyphosate? So, um, IARC was at, IARC had decided to review several pesticides for their potential for causing cancer, um, one of which was um, glyphosate. Um, and so they put together a panel of scientists who were going to review these chemicals and uh, make some decisions about whether it would ca they cause cancer or not, and uh, their basic approach to looking at that. Um, they'd asked me to uh, join them specifically for uh, four chemicals for which there was information coming out of a program I started when I was at the National Toxicology Program and running that program um, that brought in a lot of mechanistic information in sort of a very large scale and they weren't sure they knew how to approach that data and they wanted me there to help them sort of interpret it. This was the first time they were facing what is called this TOX21 data set. Um, and so they asked me to come and help them with that, and that's why I was involved. And you... after that evaluation, um, uh, I was approached by a law firm I'd already been uh, providing free advice to, uh, whether I would provide them with advice on the science underlying the glyphosate decision that was made by IARC. Um, can you turn to exhibit 230 in your binder? It should be numbered pretty easily. And if we go down here, there's a bunch of different names. I want to go down to where you're mentioned. It says your name under invited uh, specialist. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, what is an invited specialist? So an invited specialist is, uh, in essence, a consultant to the working group. So you have the core working group, which in this case I think is 16 or 17 scientists. Um, they, they write the evaluation of the literature. They come up with the opinion of what they believe the potential for carcinogenicity is for the chemicals they're looking at. Um, and write their overall decisions. That's their job. Um, sometimes the IARC decides that they need some extra expertise, but sometimes that expertise has potential conflicts of interest. And so they bring the, that expertise as invited specialists. They're not allowed to write. They're not allowed to help with the decision. They're there to provide expert advice on individual studies and just general science overall. Um, in my case, because I was working part-time for the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a non-government organization that advocates for uh, environmental uh, issues, they felt there was a potential conflict of interest, and so they didn't want me on the working group. They wanted me there simply to provide expertise to the committee. So following the IARC monograph on, on, on glyphosate and those other pesticides that were reviewed, um, you stated that you were 
you began working with a law firm, is that right? Um, that is correct. Following the IARC, well, put simply, what was IARC's conclusion, sir? Um, IARC's conclusion was that, for, for glyphosate specifically, um, IARC's conclusion was for glyphosate was that it's um, probably carcinogenic to human humans, which is a classification that has a full categorization to it and uh, rules under which it's created. And just to give the jury some context, that classification as a probable human carcinogen, uh, where does that fall? Is it the highest, second highest, third highest? IARC has um, five classification batches that they put things in. Uh, probable is the second highest. Now, following the IR classification, um, uh, do you know if there's been any scientific response by regulatory agencies to IARC? Um, there was a lot of response to the IARC monograph by regulatory agencies. Um, and did you, uh, did you take any actions to defend the IARC decision? I took actions to, to, to not so much defend the IARC decision as to um, um, highlight the differences in the scientific justification for the de de decisions that were made by IARC as compared to other groups. And is one of those groups uh, the European Union's equivalent of EPA? The European Food Safety Authority uh, Agency, yes. Um, I had discussions with them and their management. And is that group called EFSA? EFSA, yes. And I understand you actually published uh, an open letter to uh, the scientific community along with some colleagues, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Please turn to Exhibit 228. Okay. Is that a fair and accurate copy of the letter you published? Yes, it is. Okay. Publish this document. So uh, we have here uh, this document. It's titled Differences in the Carcinogenic Evaluation of Glyphosate Between the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, and the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. Do you see that? Yes. All right. And I notice on this uh, signature line there are well, how many, how many people signed this letter with you, sir? Um, there are 96 signatures, I believe. Okay. And then if we uh, just go to the back of it, uh, well, what was the ultimate conclusion from this article? Well, we were, we, in the article, we were challenging. So when EFSA, EFSA was in the process of re-reviewing re glyphosate when IARC did their review. Um, and it, the IARC review, EFSA had already said that they didn't think there was a problem with glyphosate. So when the IARC review came out, uh, it created a conflict with EFSA. So EFSA's, the, the way Europe does these things is they get authorities in each country in Europe, one or, one or two countries in Europe, to lead the effort. So in this case, the German Federal Institute for Risk Analysis was leading the effort. It, I'll just refer to them as BFR, stands for Bundesverriskamont. Okay. Um, so BFR uh, then did a appendix that walked through what they thought were the differences between IARC and EFSA um, and published that, that appendix. We're responding to that appendix more than anything else um, where we point out some of the scientific flaws in what they did. Our final conclusion was that EFSA's review was flawed scientifically, IARC's was not, uh, and that we believe the IARC classification is the correct classification. So if you look at the last page here, I'm going to call it out. Hopefully you can read it on your screen. It reads, the most appropriate and scientifically based evaluation of the cancer is reported in humans and laboratory animals as well as support of mechanistic data, is that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. On the basis of this classification, sorry, on the basis of this conclusion, and in the absence of evidence to the contrary, it is reasonable to conclude that glyphosate formulations should also be considered likely human carcinogens. Do you see that? Yes, I, I just want to draw your attention, sir, to a couple of the um, authors that joined you on this uh, letter, specifically, um, 
Do you see here uh, Anne Claire Deru? Anne Claire Deruse, yes. Sorry, Deruse. Um, and, and Dr. Deruse, I understand she was uh, an author on the recent AHS publication? Um, at the time, yes, she was author on a, several publications on glyphosate, one of them an AHS publication specifically on glyphosate. I also saw on here um, there's another uh, physician or another researcher, um, Charles Lynch. Do you see that? Yes. Um, Charles Lynch, he's also an author on the recent AHS publication. Well, that I don't know. Well, let's just check. Um, I believe the AHS publication should be in your binder. It is exhibit... Um, Uh, 550. You there? Yes. Um, is Dr. Lynch an author on the author article? Let me check real quick here. Uh, University of Iowa, Department of Epidemiology. the same name. Let me see if it's the same affiliation. Yeah, that would seem to be the same person. Based on what I've shown you, are there any authors that joined you in this letter who are also authors on the recent AHS publication? Yes. Okay. Who are those? Well, if you're talking about the Andriotti publication, I don't believe the Roots is on that publication. Oh, let's take a look, sir. It's 550. Oh, yes, she is. You're right. Absolutely. So two of them are on the most recent publication. Yeah, and so we're looking at Exhibit 550 on the screen, just so we can confirm this. Do you see Dr. DeRoos and, and Dr. Dr. Lynch? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Okay, so after IARC, uh, did you take a step further um, in looking at the science behind glyphosate? Um, yes, I did. What did you do? Well, in drafting this response to uh, EFSA, of course, I had to spend a lot of time reading through their evaluation, and they had evaluated um, studies that IARC did not evaluate. They were evaluating studies that were proprietary and not in the public domain, something IARC does not do. And so I had to spend a lot of time looking at those studies um, and other science. I, I spent just a lot more time looking at it. Um, I also responded to something done by the US EPA. That took a lot of time and effort for me to go through, not only um, looking at what EPA did, but redoing the analyses uh, and redoing some of the evaluations. And to be clear, sir, that, that work you did responding to the EPA, this open letter we just looked at responding to EFSA, were you being paid by attorneys to do that work? No, I was not being paid by anyone to do that work. Why are you doing it then? Um, again, I've spent 36 years of my life learning how to evaluate animal and human cancer data and make decisions about whether this is a carcinogen or not. That is sort of the primary thing my career has been aimed at. And I feel that um, having looked at the way these uh, um, agencies looked at this particular pesticide, they've missed all the rules that are in place that they should have followed in doing the evaluation. Okay, so when it comes to looking at whether or not an agent causes cancer, uh, what areas of science do you as a scientist look at? Um, I look at the human evidence, so um, studies that have looked at populations of humans exposed to the uh, agent, that would be epidemiology. Uh, I look at the animal, the, the laboratory animal data where you take whole animals and expose them to the agent and look to see if it causes cancer in them. And then I look at shorter laboratory experiments aimed at looking at the mechanisms by which cancer may be arising in these studies in animals and humans. All right, so I've prepared a little picture 
that I want to use to sort of help um, get the document camera to sort of get a sort of get a view of the different things. So at the top of this picture, um, on top of the stool, I'm going to write causation. Okay. Okay. And you mentioned there were these three areas of s science that you look at. Uh, the first one you mentioned was as, was epidemiology. Is that right? That's correct. Epidemiology. Okay. So I'm going to write that here on one of the legs. All right. And then you said you looked at uh, is that animal studies? Yes. All right. Animal cancer studies. Okay. So I'm going to write on this other leg. Animal studies. And then the last one was what, sir? Mechanistic studies. Okay. Mechanisms. And what, what are you looking at in mechanistic studies? You're, you're looking at, as a general rule, you're looking at things that happen at the level of the cell, inside the cell, that will start or enhance the, the carcinogenic process. All right. So we're going to call those cell studies. Is that okay? They're not always cell studies. Okay. I'd call them mechanism studies. All right. All right. So just generally speaking, sir, uh, from a scientific perspective, uh, it, what is the requirement of looking at all three of these legs? Well, they all contribute to a general decision about whether or not a chemical can cause cancer. Um, epidemiology is a very important part of this, but um, seldom by itself does epidemiology give you this is clearly a cause. Animal studies are an important part of this, but seldom by themselves do they give you a definitive answer that this can cause cancer in humans, and the same with mechanisms. Together, they give you a better picture of the overall um, potential, and you can make a better overall decision. Okay. So what I want to do today um, is really focus in on animal studies, mechanism studies, and epidemiology, okay? Okay. And uh, just, just for your benefit, the jury will have heard testimony from Dr. Beate Ritz. Do you know who she is? Yes. And what is her specialty? Epidemiology. Okay. So they're going to have heard a lot about epidemiology, so we're not going to spend much time on that. I don't want to, you know, repeat ourselves. But I want to focus primarily on these first two, the animal studies and the cell studies, okay? Okay. All right. Um, let's start off with these animal studies. Uh, what is an animal study? Um, so an animal study is for cancer, specifically for cancer. Um, is you, you take a, uh, an animal, you take a group of animals, a large number sometimes, uh, and you expose them to the chemical that you're interested in for a good part of their lifetime, and you see if they have more cancer in them than a group of animals that are not exposed. So you can make a comparison and see if the chemical causes cancer in the animal. I understand, actually, in preparation for your testimony today, you helped put together a PowerPoint walking through this. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So let's take a look at that PowerPoint. It's Exhibit 881. You go to the computer. And, sir, how, how, you, how are you physically doing? Is this a good time for a break, or do you want to? I'm fine. Okay, great. So um, let's start off at the top here. We have this first slide. It says rodent studies. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. And the first bullet point reads, humans share 95% DNA with, the, with rodents. What does that mean? Well, it's just a reminder of the fact that um, humans and rodents have a lot of the similar um, biological pathways that make up our lives. We're both mammals. Um, and so much of, of, of what goes on at the cellular level in Rats and mice um, are very similar, if not almost identical in some cases, to what happens in humans. All of that is controlled by DNA and mitochondrial DNA and other things, but it's, it's all controlled by our genetic heritage. And the genetic heritage of the mouse and the human, rodents and humans, is very close. 
Um, it says humans share similar pathways for toxin eradication. What is that referring to? Well, when, when, you, when you ingest anything, be it a chemical or be it food or whatever it is, um, your body absorbs it. It distributes it throughout the body. Um, it metabolizes it, meaning the molecular systems in the cells in the body break it down into things the cells can either use or get rid of because they don't want it around, and then the body eliminates it. So this whole process of the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, there are great similarities between rodents and humans in those processes. And how is that relevant when you're looking at the issue of, for example, cancer? Well, for a chemical to cause cancer, it has to be absorbed. It has to be distributed to the, sor to the source of the, the cancer, cancer. Sometimes it needs to be changed into a new chemical that will cause the cancer, so that's metabolism. Um, and to prevent the cancer, it has to be eliminated. It has to be gotten rid of somehow. So it's very important to, um, to the uh, uh, idea that a chemical can cause cancer in humans. If it's not absorbed, it can't cause cancer in humans. If it's not distributed to the, to the site where the can, can, cancer occurs, it's not causing that cancer. Um, if the cancer is caused by a specific metabolite, and in humans that metabolite is not formed, you can't, see, you can't cause the cancer, etc. It says your standard model for studying cancer. What does that refer to? So, typically, um, regulatory agencies will request corporations that want a, a, a chemical to go into the environment uh, as a pesticide or even as pharmaceuticals, they'll request uh, that they do a study for safety. And one of the safety studies they request is an animal cancer study. And these rodents are the typical way of doing it. A typical animal study includes rats and mice, males and females, in multiple groups for the life of the animals. Um, it says use specially bred mice and rats, and if you look to the right, we have looks like CD1 mouse and Wistar rats. What is that referring to? So, when you, whenever you do science, you, you want to make sure you document exactly what you do. If, if I went outside and collected a bunch of mice from around the dumpster um, <laughs> in the back of the, the hotel um, and did a study with them, it would be an interesting, valid study about how a chemical might affect mice in their normal environment, but nobody could repeat it unless they came and caught the same animals behind the same dumpster at the same hotel. So what we try to do in science is we, we have these strains of mice and rats, even substrains. Um, we label them, we breed them, we take care to try to keep them genetically the same over multiple years so that if I do a study with a CD1 mouse and somebody else wants to repeat what I did, they can get a CD1 mouse, do the same study, and hopefully get the same answer. That, that way we can see that the science is consistent and it's stronger if you can repeat it. So we maintain these different strains of rats and mice to make sure it's repeatable. All right. Um, the next one says, mouse models uh, are commonly used to develop drugs for lymphoma treatments. What is that referring to? So, as I mentioned before, when, when you're developing a drug or something, you do safety assessments. And you want to make sure that drug is safe before you give it to people. But as another part, you want to make sure it's going to work. And you try to do that before you start giving it to people. Um, there's a lot of of work done with human cells, but typically they will also find a similar disease in a model, in this case for lymphoma, malignant lymphoma seen in the mouse is a very similar dis disease to B cell lymphomas, which are a subset of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas seen in humans. Um, and so if you have a mouse model that, that spontaneously, just because it lives, gets a lot of malignant lymphomas, then you can use that and start giving it your new treatment and see if you reduce the lymphomas arising in those animals or get rid of them after they've started. And if that works, then you've got a potential drug for using in humans. So you create a model of the drug, of the, of the disease that you can give the, the drug to to see if it's gonna work. The mouse is a good model for 
lymphomas in humans. All right, so I understand you have developed a sort of walkthrough of a typical rodent study, and we're going to focus on a mouse here, okay? Okay. All right, so the first step, it says mice are placed in groups where they are treated identically. What does that refer to? So when, you, when you're going to do one of these studies, you, you, you don't want to do it with one mouse, obviously, because uh, it's not enough information that one mouse got cancer or didn't get cancer. So you have groups of mice that you work with. Um, and you want to treat them identically because so I'm going to take the mice and I'm going to break them into groups. And some groups are going to get exposed to my chemical that I'm worried about and some groups are not going to be exposed. And what I want to be able to do is compare the exposed groups to the non-exposed group. But in order to do that clearly without any problem, I have to make sure they're all treated exactly the same. Because if I give my unexposed group, say, bottled water, and I give my exposed group, um, besides the chemical, I give them tap water straight out of the pipe, then I can't tell if the, the cancers are due to the chemical or the differences in the water. So I make sure that everything in these animals' lives are identical except for the exposure I'm interested in. Okay. And it says each group typically contains 50 males and 50 females. Oh, what does that refer to, and what's the significance of 50? Well, 50 is a practical limitation. These studies are fairly expensive to do. The more animals you have, the more expensive they get, um, uh, based on work I did in my thesis and other work and uh, work by other people. 50 seems to be a good number for um, being sensitive enough to see things that might occur. Um, and uh, not so small that you wouldn't see them if they're there. Okay. And what's the significance of having males and females? Ah, yes. Um, well, males and females can respond differently to chemicals, um, if nothing else. Um, the targets can be different. Uh, males can have testicular cancer, females can't. Females can have uterine cancer, males can't. Um, uh, females tend to get mammary tumors. Males tend to not get those breast cancers that women can get. And in the animals, it's mammary tumors, males or females, um, because of tissue size and tish different tissue functions. Um, but even in typical organs like livers and lungs, um, males and females tend to get different sensitivities to different exposures. So you always break it down and look at both males and females so you can look at the entire human population, not just one gender. Okay. So uh, how many different treatment groups are there? It says here there are four treatment groups, typically 400 mice. What is that referring to? Well, typically you take 200 males and 200 females, 50 per group. You break them into four separate groups. One of the group gets no chemical, and the other groups get the exposure to whatever chemical you're interested in. Um, and you have a group of females that get no chemical, a group of males that get no chemical, the same on the exposure groups. Um, and here, we're, we'll, let's use for this example glyphosate, okay? Okay. All right, so how then do we determine uh, what dose we give? So I understand that the ones on the left don't get glyphosate. The right. three groups on the right uh, they do. How do you determine which dose they get? So it's not random. Um, it's a very serious part of the design of a cancer bioassay. Um, you, we're interested in protecting human health. That's, that's the purpose of doing this. The purpose is not to protect the health of rats and mice from cancer. The, the, the goal is to protect human health. And you might allow a beneficial product onto the market if the cancer risk was low enough. So typically, regulatory agencies will look for a risk that's below one in 100,000 or one in a million and say, oh, that's a very small risk and the benefit from this thing is bigger than the risk, so we're going to allow it in, in society. Um, but you can't measure one in 100,000 in order for me to be able to see that, I'd have to have 500,000 mice or rats. So instead, you, you assume that as the exposure gets bigger, the probability of getting cancer gets bigger. 
So there's going to be a dose that gives you one in 100,000 in the mice, but maybe 10 times that dose will give you one in 10,000, and 10 times that dose will give you one in 1,000, 10 times that, one in 100, 10 times that, one in 10. And so what you try to do in an animal bioassay is you get the highest dose you possibly can in hopes that if this causes cancer, you'll be in this range of one in 20, one in 30 probability of getting cancer so you can actually see it in your 50 animals. So how do you find that dose? Let me ask you a question about that. So it says here the highest dose is usually the maximum tolerated dose. What is that? So that's the dose you try to find, but of course you can't be certain. So you have to get indications in advance of what that will be. So what you typically do is a 90-day study. It's the same basic outline, controls, multiple treated groups, smaller numbers of animals, and a lot more groups, usually six or so, maybe seven groups. Um, and what you do is you expose them for 90 days. And during that 90 days, you look to see if the exposure is harming them in any way, and I mean any way. You look for changes in body weight. You look for disorientation in the animals. You look for them eating less food or drinking less water. You look inside of them at the end and see if there's damage to tissues or organs. What you're trying to find is the highest dose that in 90 days does not cause any harm at all to the animals um, that you can see. And that dose is the maximum tolerated dose. And then you use that dose for the entire two years in the longer term experiment. But I mean, doctor, if you're using this maximum tolerated dose, I mean, doesn't that sort of make it no longer relevant to humans? Um, no, of course not. In the long term, if the, if, if, if the mechanisms by which the cancer occurs at that high dose are the same mechanisms that work at low doses, then in fact it is relevant. And the whole purpose of doing the 90-day study is to draw, try to avoid any other mechanisms that might not operate at the lower doses. So you're trying to avoid that by looking for toxicity in advance of doing the studies. But um, in most cases, it's relevant to the lower exposure that people would see. So that gets us to the high dose. Um, what about the rest of the doses, the low dose and the mid dose? Well, there you're looking at fractions of the high dose, um, some percentage, because you want to see what happens at lower and lower doses. The idea would be that um, you're going to see some sort of pattern in those exposures, and that pattern also tells you something about further down that dose scale into the range where humans are exposed. The actual doses that are chosen are somewhat subjective, but most people work from um, the algorithm I did in my thesis, which would put you at about somewhere between uh, one-tenth to one-third of the maximum dose for the lowest dose and between one-third and one-half of the maximum dose for the middle dose. Most of the studies we're looking at for glyphosate have one-tenth of the maximum tolerated dose at the lowest dose, one-third of the maximum tolerated dose at the mid-dose. Okay, so we've gone through how you set the doses for the, for the groups for the mice that are going to get glyphosate, okay? Um, how, how long does this sort of process run for? The whole bioassay and the, the startup with the 90-day study and everything else? Well, no, let's, that's, that, you're fair enough. That's probably okay. too much to ask. How long does the, the, the study go for for the mice that you're studying? Once you start the study, um, it usually goes for two years, although some mice studies now are done for 18 months depending on the strain of mouse and how long it naturally lives. Um, but that's generally two years. And how old are the mice at the beginning of the study? Typically the mice and the rats uh, are six weeks old when they start the study because that's when they have just reached puberty. So you, the, these studies were originally thought of as adult exposure studies. So you start when the animal reaches puberty, which is when people might start working in a job and you take it for their whole lifespan. Now, maybe, I don't know if you know this, but if you have two years for a CD1 mouse, right, um, how old would a two-year-old mouse be an equivalent of 
human years. That varies by strain and species, but let's just say approximately 65 to 70 years old. Well then, sir, what if, what if you're, you have a cancer that, you know, comes out at later ages, like in the 70s or 80s? Would, would, this, would these mice studies capture those? If the, if the thing you're looking at, the chemical agent you're looking at, shortens the time to cancer, yes, you would see it because it would come before that 70 uh, time point. If all the chemical does is um, uh, increase the probability of getting that cancer in that time frame, then you wouldn't see it. Okay. So we run the study for, for two years. Um, and at the end of two years, what do we do? What do we look for in the mice? So typically, in almost all the bioassays, at the end of, at the, end of the study, end of two years, they... Um, sacrifice all of the animals. They kill them humanely. Um, and every animal, including the ones who have died earlier than the two years, just from natural causes during the course of the study, uh, all of those animals are looked at very carefully. Every organ is examined by a pathologist who looks for tumors, little lumps and bumps in the organs. In addition, they take um, and take slices of each tissue, very thin slices, put it on a microscope slide, and they look at them under the microscope to see if they can see cellular changes that look like cancer. Um, so they examine very carefully all over the animals. And uh, when they're taking these slices from the various animals, um, are they the same sort of portions of the organ for each animal, or does it change? Uh, just like the feeding and just like everything else, you have protocols that specify exactly what slices you are to take in the animals, uh, e exactly what angle and across what part of the tissue and organ. Yes, they're very much uniform. What if there's a tumor in another part that wasn't part of the typical slicing? If the tumor is big enough that you can see it or feel it, there's a lump or a bump there, they will take a slice through that, and that's part of the protocol. But if it's smaller than that, what we would call microscopic, the only way you'd see it is under a microscope, then no, there's, there's no way you'd ever see it because you don't take a slice there, you just won't see it. All right, so we have on the slides here, we have uh, some red circles that have popped up. What are those supposed to reflect, sir? Well, that simply is intended to show you um, what you might see in a typical bioassay for a typical single cancer type. Um, you would have an animal that has the cancer or doesn't have the cancer. Here, the little rats or mice, these are mice, that are circled with the red uh, or mice that had a particular cancer. Um, and what you're looking at here are, uh, for example, in the low dose group, these are 50 mice and two of the 50 mice had tumors. So that's sort of the basis for the analysis two out of 50 animals with a specific tumor. Now, um, when you say two tumors, is that two tumors of a specific type or just two tumors generally? Generally, it's two tumors of a specific type. You analyze the data for each tumor type. The argument is that um, um, the tumors are generally independent of each other and you're interested in what this might mean to the human population. So you might have a chemical, uh, there's, a number of chemicals out there um, that hit multiple organs and multiple with multiple types of cancer. So I can think of one now that has five or six different cancer sites. Um, uh, each of those cancer sites are of concern to human populations and so you treat them each separately rather than just did this animal get a cancer or not. No, this animal got a lung cancer, got a liver cancer, it got an adrenal cancer and so we'd be worried about all of those. And so when we look at all the various tumors that appear in the treatment groups, we have this slide here, and I actually think there's a typo. In the mid-dose group, it says three out of 50. It probably should say two. I want to see two, two circles there. Do you see that? Yeah, that happens. Okay. In any event, uh, w what are you doing when you're looking at the various tumors in the group? What are, you, what are you looking for? Well, there are two ways to analyze this type of data. One way to analyze the data is to compare the low dose group to the control, the mid dose group to the control, and the high dose group to the control. So here, you would compare for the low dose, two out of 50 against one out of 50 in the control and ask yourself, is this unusual under the assumption that 
there actually is no carcinogenic risk to this computer to this to this for this chemical. So if there's no risk for this chemical, would a difference between one out of fifty versus two out of fifty be important? And the answer to that question would be no in this case. But when you look at the high dose versus control, five out of fifty versus one out of fifty, um, that five out of fifty may be very different. And so there's this statistics that allows you to ask that question and calculate the probability that you would see 5 out of 50 versus 1 out of 50 if truth was there's no effect going on in this population. So that's one way. The other way to analyze the data is if you look at this, you've got low dose, mid dose, high dose, and the question would be a slightly different question. As you increase the dose, is the risk of getting cancer increasing? And so there, you look to see if, if I drew a line through all of these data, is that line going up as the dose goes up, or is it in fact flat? And here you do the same thing you did with the, the pairwise test. Here you, do, you, you ask yourself, if truth is there's nothing going on, truth is it's perfectly flat, what's the probability that I see this slope? And if that probability is very small, then you reject the idea that it's flat in favor of the idea that there is indeed an increasing risk with increasing dose. So, sir, uh, you said five, but I believe here in the high dose group there's four. Do you see that? That is correct, and, okay. and thank you for correcting me on that. And I'm pretty sure four out of 50 versus one out of 50 is not going to be statistically significant in okay. these data sets. This whole process, though, where you have these 50 mice per group, where you're looking at the slope of the lines and comparing it statistically to the control. Is that, is that process something that you actually helped develop when you did your PhD? Um, some of it. Um, most of the, the, the simple pairwise comparisons of one group versus that, that was known from the 1930s. Fisher's exact test has been around a very long time. Um, trend tests, which look at these slopes, um, now that's something I worked on post-PhD, my first few years at NIH, where I did a lot of work in that area. And this approach that you developed in your work, is it the approach that's still used today? It is the standard way of analyzing these types of studies by the U.S. National Toxicology Program and many toxicology programs around the world. All right, so I want to I get real here. We've talked about a hypothetical experiment. Let's talk about an actual study on glyphosate to give, for, to explain to the jury how this actually works out, okay? Okay. I want to draw your attention to uh, the Wood study from 2009, okay? Okay. Are you familiar with that study? Yes, I am. All right. And well, what are we looking at here on this slide? So this is bigger mice, and you've only brought in the mice that actually have the tumor. So here you had um, three dose groups uh, and one control group. The controls saw no malignant lymphomas in 50 animals. Actually, is it 50 or 51? Uh, I don't remember the study, but it's either 50 or 51. The low dose saw one animal with the tumor. The mid dose saw two animals with the malignant lymphoma and the high dose saw five animals out of 50 with the malignant lymphoma. So let's break what this is showing. So in the study on glyphosate, what, if any, is the significance of not having a single tumor or a single malignant lymphoma in the control group? Uh, it just means that in this particular case, which is an 18-month study, I believe, of uh, in the mice, that um, as a matter of spontaneously appearing tumors, none have appeared of this type in these males in this study. Okay. So then we have one in the low dose, two in the mid dose, and five in the high dose. What, what's the significance of that? Well, the pattern's important here. You can see that as the exposure is increasing, the number of animals with the tumor is increasing out of a constant 50. So the proportion of animals with the tumor has increased, and that's very important to look at. Um, and at the highest dose, you have a fairly big number of animals with the tumor relative to the controls. Um, and so I, you've, you've, we've, you've plotted them out here, it looks like, in a bar graph. Do you see that? Yes. And if we go to the last slide, 
It reads dose response or trend. What does that mean? Well, again, that's now looking at the data and asking the question, um, do these data indicate a concern for malignant lymphomas? Did, did this chemical cause malignant lymphomas in these mice in this study? That's the question you have to first ask yourself. Um, and there you do your statistical tests, <coughs> the pairwise test, each group against control, and the trend test, like I said before. And here in the trend test, you're looking to see if that line that you're looking at has a slope. The slope of the line is the angle at which it climbs. You're asking, is that slope greater than zero? A zero slope is a flat line. Any slope that's bigger than that is a positive line. You're testing whether it's not zero or not. In this case, it is significantly different from zero. So what? this shows a significant increase in the proportion of animals with tumor as the dose increases. So what does this study show you when it comes to lymphoma? If this is the only study I have, it shows me that at, in this study, for these animals, it's fairly clear that um, glyphosate is causing malignant lymphomas. Well, hold on, doctor. You say glyphosate is causing malignant lymphomas. How do you know these tumors would have just happened naturally, just because mice get tumors? How do you know it's not that? Well, that's the whole purpose of the study, isn't it? I've controlled everything else in the study. So all of these mice are being treated exactly the same way. So if it were spontaneous, if it were just random chance, um, it's unlikely they would line up like this. And that's what the statistics is telling you. That's why you do a statistical analysis. It's, it's evaluating the probability that you see this sort of pattern by chance. What is the statistic? What is the probability that you'd see something like this by chance? Uh, if I remember the, the, the study correctly, I think this is um, 0 0.007 probability, which is about 7 in 1,000 chance that this arises by chance. You can also go look at, um, these are CD1 mice, a certain substrain. Uh, you can look at other experiments that have been done in this same mouse strain. And every one of those other cancer experiments has a control group which gets no exposure. And so you can look at all those control groups from the other studies and also see how much variation there is in the control response. And that can tell you also something about the probability of seeing this type of response. Well, this, you said this is an 18-month study, is that right? That is correct. So for an 18-month studies, uh, for, for animals, these CD1 mice that are not exposed to any chemicals, what is the rate that they spontaneously get lymphoma? Um, I did look that up, and um, it's probably about 1 in 50. Okay. And on average, so, 1 in 50. So you'd expect to see 1 in 50, and in this high dose, you're seeing 5 of 50. Is that right? Correct. What's the significance of that? Well, that's, again, what the statistics is telling you. The statistics is telling you the significance of it is that you stand only a 7 in 1,000 part chance of ever seeing this type of pattern given do you believe that there was nothing there. All right. We're going to take a break in a second. I really appreciate your, uh, your, your endurance here. Um, I want to, uh, before we take the break, though, I want to just cover generally uh, whether or not there are any guidelines that govern sort of how we, how we look at animal studies? Uh, there are many guidelines. Um, the National Toxicology Program has guidelines. The EPA has guidelines. Um, the European Food Safety Authority has guidelines. Um, there's a, uh, an international organization called the Organization of Economic and Cooperative Development, OECD. Uh, OECD has guidelines. Um, most people follow all of these guidelines, um, and yeah, they're there for not only how to design the study, how to run the study, how to do the pathology at the end of the study, but there's also rules on how to analyze the data from the study and how to interpret these studies. All right, um, look at exhibit 388 in your binder. And does this document go over some of the standard scientific approaches for looking at long-term animal carcinogenicity studies? Yes, it does. All right. Let's take a look at those standards very quickly. Uh, it's a page ending in 2-21.
Okay. All right. The very bottom of the page, uh, section 2214, assessment of evidence of carcinogenicity from long-term animal studies. It reads, in general, observation of tumors under different circumstances lends support to the significance of the findings for animal carcinogenicity. Uh, sir, do you agree with that? Yes. Can you explain what that means? Well, it, it, the, um, it, it just says, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's a statement that, that is so obvious it's hard to even say what it means. Um, <laughs> I have to observe tumors in an animal study to be able to decide if tumors are caused in the animal study. So the observation of those tumors contributes to the decision about whether you have a significant finding of, of animal carcinogenicity in the animals. Okay, great. So the next sentence reads, significance is generally increased by the observation of more of the factors listed below. Do you see that? Yeah. And if we turn to the next page, it has those factors listed. Do you see that? Oh, sorry, there at the top of this page. Uh, yes, I see that. Okay, great. Uh, I want to quickly run through these. Um, first one says uncommon tumor types. What does that refer to? So when, you, when you're doing an animal study, um, certain tumors almost never appear in animals. Um, the classic example for me is um, fluoride. The National Toxicology Program did a study of fluoride to see if it caused cancer in the animals. Um, in two of the high exposure rats in that study, we saw what's called an osteosarcoma, which is a blood, which is a bone tumor, but it didn't appear in bone, it appeared in the muscle of the rat. So you got a, a, an odd tumor in the muscle of the rat. We never seen in 50 rat studies an osteosarcoma in any muscle tissue anywhere. So it's an extremely rare tumor. Um, almost certainly it arose because of the exposure to the, to the fluoridation. Great. Um, it says tumors at multiple sites. What does that refer to? Um, uh, so if, if I see a chemical that in the rodents that only causes one tumor in liver, then the chances of this being a rodent carcinogen, carcinogen depends only on that one tumor. But if the chemical comes in and you see tumors in the liver, the lungs, the blood, the kidneys, the brain, then the chances of making a mistake and saying this chemical causes tumors in the animals and it really doesn't is lowered completely. Okay. It says tumors by more than one route of administration. What's that referring to? So you do a study and you give the chemical by feed to the animal. I do a study and I have the animal breed the chemical in. In your study, the animal gets liver tumors. In my study, the animal gets lung tumors. Perfectly reasonable if it's a point of contact carcinogen. Um, that strengthens the finding that this can cause cancer in rodents. Um, it says tumors in multiple species, strains, or both sexes. What's the significance of that? So you do a study in rats, I do a study in mice. You see a cancer in the rat, I see a cancer in the mice. Chances are it's causing cancer in these animals. They may not be the same cancers, but it strengthens the overall call that this chemical can cause cancer in the rats and mice. Males and females, same thing. It says progression of lesions from pre-neoplastic to benign to malignant. What's that referring to? So very few cancers just, boom, pop up and you've got a cancer. They start as pre-malignant states. The, the classic example most people know about, skin tumors. Your skin tumor starts as a little bump on your skin. You might get a little worried about it, go to the doctor and they go, oh, that's a nevi, that's a pre-malignant skin lesion. And if you don't do something about it, it gets worse and worse and turns into a real skin cancer um, that is very worrisome. Um, so a lot of tumors arise that way. And when that's the case for those types of tumors, with the chemical, you hope to see the progression in the animals. You'd like to see some animals with um, very early findings, some with beginning of a tumor, and some with the, the real tumors there. Okay, great. The next one says reduced latency of neoplastic lesions. Is, uh, before we even get into that, is that really relevant to the, the glyphosate data? Um, yeah, 
Okay, so what is it? I would have to argue that it is, is relevant to the glyphosate data. It's the thing you asked me about before. Um, if it's only occurring after 70, 70 years of life, will we actually see it? If you reduce the latency, if you reduce the time it takes to get the tumor, you'll see them earlier, and because you're looking at a fixed time, you might see a, an increase in risk if you look at the right time. Okay. A metastasis, what is that? So when you get a real malignant tumor, what's called a malignant tumor, malignant tumors are known called that because they tend to invade the surrounding region. Malignant tumors also can metastasize. So pieces of the tumor, one cell, two, three cells, can break off and transport to other parts of the body and continue to become a tumor. So you can have a liver tumor that breaks off one liver cell and it gets caught in the lung and you get a lung tumor, but the lung tumor is actually a metastasized liver tumor. And you can actually see that. Um, unusual magnitude of tumor response. What does that refer to? Um, the controls have no tumors. The highest dose has 100% of the animals with tumor. That would be an unusual magnitude of response. You see such a massive response, it can't possibly be anything else but the chemical causing that massive response. Like, so a second ago, when we looked at the wood study, there was nothing in the control and five in the high dose. Would that be an unusual response? No. Okay. That would be usual magnitude of response. Gotcha. Proportion of malignant tumors, uh, what does that refer to? There you're just looking at the whole picture of the animals themselves. Um, uh, what, what proportion of the animals in the whole study have malignant tumors of any, any sort? If that's increasing with exposure, that's an indication of a concern. Okay. And the last one here is dose-related increases. I think you've talked about this. But Correct. Can you, is that what we were talking about with the dose response? Correct. Okay, great. Um, and in the last sentence here in the, before, the first paragraph, it says, in these cancer guidelines, tumors observed in animals are generally assumed to indicate that an agent may produce tumors in humans. Is that your understanding of the sort of science behind animal studies? Correct. That's why they were done in the first place. And I still hold that that's a reasonable assumption. Okay. And we're going to take a break in a quick second. But before I do that, I just want to uh, show the jury uh, these charts that you've created. Um, get that. Can't document camera. All right, sir. So um, I want to show you uh, exhibit 882. It's on the screen. Do you see that, sir? Yes, I see it. And just quickly, very quickly, what is this chart? Um, these are five mouse studies, and these are the tumors that were significantly elevated in the five mouse studies. Okay. And we also have a similar chart for the various rat studies. Is that right? Uh, yes, these are one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, the seven rat studies. Okay, great. And um, sh just after the break, I'm going to go through what all these studies show and what this chart means. Does that sound good? Okay, sure. And what I'd like to do is, during the break, I'd like you to fill in these charts so we can save some time for the jury. All right? Okay. All right, great. Let's take a break. Fill it in with the... The markers. I'll give you a marker. But significance of the findings. Exactly, and then we'll walk through what your findings okay. are. Good enough. All right, doctor, thank you so much for uh, coming back. Um, you had a chance during the break to review those charts, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, we're looking at here, uh, this is exhibit 882, and it has all these black markings on it. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, and that black markings, are those, were those done by you? Yes, they were. Okay. Um, and before we move on, I just want to clarify something. A second ago, when we were looking at those EPA guidelines, um, and we're looking at those different factors, are those the same factors that you yourself consider? Yes, of okay. course. And I, I, I also occurred to me that you used a couple of words uh, in the previous portion. That I want to make sure we don't have any misunderstandings about. The first word is a pretty obvious one, but it's toxicology. What is toxicology? It's the, the, the branch of science that studies the um, toxic properties of chemicals in not just humans, but anywhere. But generally, my area, it's focus on humans. And um, I'm not sure if the jury can hear, but there's a bit of a noise going on in the background. Do you hear that, sir? Yes. Uh, what is the meeting that's occurring over there? It says Australian pathologist on the door. OK, and that, I asked you that because I want to ask you, what is pathology? Oh, a pathologist is, pathology is um, um, 
You might know it better by the word anatomy. These are people who go into a body and look at it and discern what's going on in that body. They, they evaluate the, the, the pathology of the, of the organs and tissues. Do they have normal? Do they look normal? Do they appear to be functioning normal? Or do they have manifestations that are different? It's a physical observational science as compared to something like molecular biology that's going in and looking at the chemical reactions within these cells. They're looking at the organization of the cells, the structure of the cells, how they relate to each other in terms of a view. And then the last word that was used earlier before the break was something called a bioassay. Well, what is that? Uh, bioassay is just another word for an experimental study in toxicology. Um, Basically, a bioassay means I'm taking biological material and exposing it to something. So that's humans, animals, cells, um, I, and I'm doing an exposure study. And so going back here to Exhibit 882, which is on the screen, all of these different columns, uh, Kanesevich and Hogan, Atkinson, Sujimoto, are those bioassays? Yes, each one of them is a bioassay. Okay, and each one of these s s columns here listed, does that refer to what we went over earlier about what a, what a rodent study looks like? Correct, each one of these is a rodent study. Okay, how many total rodent studies have been done on glyphosate? You know, I'm never certain I've got them all, but as of this point, I would count 24 um, rodent bioassays for cancer. Um, and my understanding is on these charts, there's only 12 listed. Do you see that? That's correct. Why is that? Um, 12 of the studies are documented well enough, presented well enough, um, uh, done in a way that is consistent with guidelines uh, well enough that I consider them worthy of part of an evaluation of this sort. The other 12, Ten of them are clearly um, limited in their interpretation, limited in the way that they presented the data, limited in such a way that I don't think they're adequate for an evaluation of this sort, so I have excluded them. Um, all of those ten have also been excluded by most of the regulatory authorities out there, so it's not unusual. The remaining two, one of them is a different type of study. It's what's called an initiation promotion study, and if we want to talk about that, we can get there later. And the last one is an animal bioassay that I just found um, that looks like it's well conducted, but it's really poorly documented. So I can't include it because I really don't know everything about it. Um, so it's not included here. Okay. So looking at these mouse studies, um, Let's kind of walk through what, what, what is being said on this chart, just so the jury can sort of interpret it and understand it. Okay. Um, so the first column, it says Knesevich and Hogan, 1983. What does that refer to? So that's the two um, lead authors of the report from the animal cancer study. 1983 is the year. And I've also written 24 in there because this particular study was a 24-month study. The animals were exposed to glyphosate for two years. And this is in feed. All of these are feeding studies. The chemical is mixed in with the food, and the animals eat it. Now, if we look at the top here, it says 1983. It says Atkinson, 1993. Sujimoto, 1997. What do those years refer to? The years in which the reports were completed or submitted to the regulatory agencies, uh, I'm not absolutely certain, but it's a year associated with the information I have on that bioassay. The assays themselves were done before that date. And of these five studies on this chart, um, which ones or which one was done by Monsanto? Um, I think Kanisevich and Hogan is a Monsanto study, but I, I'm really not certain because I, uh, it didn't matter to me as reviewing these who did the study. The question was, what's the quality of the study? What's it say, et cetera? Okay, great. 
So let's look at kinase fission Hogan. So we have this 24, you, ref, you said that refers to the length of the study. Um, and then we have the blue box, and it says kidney carcinomas and adenomas. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. What is that referring to? So that's a finding from the study. Um, th this is one set of tumors, kidney tumors, and the tumors in the kidney come in two forms carcinomas, which are the malignant tumors, and adenomas, which are the precursors to the carcinomas. So that's the pre-malignant tumors. Um, and typically when you have them, you can analyze them separately and you can analyze them as combined. Here I'm presenting the combined results. Um, I've also got the individual results in a separate picture, but the combined results are good enough here. Um, I've circled trend because they are statistically significant in their trend, which is that slope climb that we see before. Um, there's a single plus there. If you slide down a little bit on the chart, you'll see I put a, a little legend down there. Oh, down here. Yes. So the plus on the chart means that the statistical probability of seeing that trend is between 0.1 and 0.05. So I will refer to that as marginally significant. Typically, in these studies, 5%, 0.05, is what people refer to as statistically significant. Is that referring to these two pluses right here? Correct. Okay. So when it's two pluses, that means it is below 5%, but above 1%. And people talk about highly significant as below 1%. So that 0.01, that's the three pluses. Okay, great. So you're going from, there's a trend, but it's not extremely strong. That's one plus. There's a trend, it's strong. And the bottom one, there's a trend, and it's very strong. So that's what the three are broken down as. You also have here um, HC, historical controls. What does that refer to? I'll explain that when we go back to kidneys. Okay, let's go back to kidneys. So we're back to <clears throat> kidneys. Correct. And so you've circled the trend and there's a plus. That's correct. So that means it's marginally significant trend. Correct. In okay. this case, I think it was 0 0.062, 6.2%. Okay. And it's in males, and not that, in females. And that's why you circled the M here? Right. And I did not circle, circle dose. And that means that when you compare each dose group to the control group, there are none that were statistically significantly different from control. If I circle dose, that means that at least one of those dose groups was different than the control all by itself. Gotcha. Now, I put a little line to the side here, and I've written HC, and I put two pluses on top of that. So remember I told you you can look back at <coughs> other control groups from other studies in the same um, species, same strain, same sex, and look to see if this looks different than those control populations. Well, it turns out there are statistical ways of bringing in that historical evidence and evaluating the current study using that historical evidence from other control groups. And so I've done that here using what's known as the Tyrone test for historical controls. Um, in my expert report, I used a uh, um, a calculation that I had done on my own. Um, it was criticized, so I went to one of the literature um, approaches and used one of the standard approaches, Tyrone's test um, for historical controls, and I applied it here, and it shows a p-value that's less than 0.05. All right, sir, so we've looked at the, the kidney carcinomas and the Knesevich and Hogan tests from 1983. I want to jump forward to Su Sujimoto just to sort of keep it consistent. We again have kidney carcinomas and adenomas. Do you see that? Yes, I see that. Okay, and so let me see if I get my understanding of your, your, your symbols here. The circle with the plus, what does that mean? Trend test was positive, uh, marginally significant. And then you again circled the M. Do you see that? For males, that's correct. So, so this is sort of the same sort of result. It's a trend, marginally significant in males. Correct. Okay. And then um, you have the historical controls here. Correct. And that one has three pluses. Correct. So the difference between... Highly significant as compared to just significant. Okay, so the difference between the Sujimoto and Knesevich and Hogan when it comes to kidney carcinomas 
is in Knesevich and Hogan, it was just significant, the historical control result, but in Sujimoto, it was highly significant. Correct. Okay. And you only use historical controls in two situations. One situation, all the guidelines tell you that the best control group to use in evaluating cancer data is the concurrent control, the control that was used in the current experiment. And that's what you should use, except in two situations, in my opinion. One situation is where you have a rare tumor. A rare tumor is defined in most toxicological literature as a tumor that occurs at less than 1% frequency in these animals. The kidney tumors that we're looking at here are rare tumors by anyone's definition. They occur at about um, one per 400 animals, roughly, about 0.25% of the time. Um, and so it's appropriate here to look at the historical controls and compare them because it's a rare tumor. The other case of using historical controls is when you have an odd tumor response. And what you mean there is when you have a very low control response and then all of the treated groups have identical or close to identical response and it's much higher. And your question in that situation is, should the historical controls, have, should the controls have been up here? In which case it's perfectly flat. Or is this reasonable? In which case you've got an increase, but there's no trend. It's just increasing flat, which is an unusual response. And so those are the two cases you're looking at. But here we're looking at it because it's a rare tumor. Okay, that's helpful. Um, the, the other thing I want to clarify is in Knesevich and Hogan, it was 24, and in Sujimoto, it was 18. That's correct. Um, the 18 there refers to the number of months that these animals were exposed. So they were exposed for less time. When they finished the study, they were younger animals. The reason this historical control is now highly significant, rather than just significant, is because in 18 months, you see even fewer kidney tumors in these animals. So their historical control rate is much lower and you're still seeing a positive response, and so it makes for a much more significant finding. And if we, I just want to finish the loop here on the kidney tumors. We have this last study here, Kumar 2001. Do you see that? Correct. And you see it's, it's shaded light gray versus the white. I can't really see the light gray, but it, it should be shaded differently. It's a different strain of mouse. And that's my question. So why is, why is this study slightly different than the others? Yes, the others, all four of the others are CD1 mice, one of the special strains. Uh, this is a Swiss Webster mouse. Uh, it is a different strain of mouse. And so you would expect different historical responses, different control responses, even different responses to the chemical, potentially. So this is in a different strain, and we see again a trend in males that's positive, is that right? Correct, it's, it's marginally significant. Just like the other two studies were? Correct. Um, what, if any, significance is the fact that you're seeing the same tumor response across different strains of mice? Oh, I will note, I didn't do historical controls in that one, not because it's not rare, it's because I couldn't find a historical control population oh. for that particular type of mouse and I can't use the historical population from the CD1 mice to do that calculation. Um, so you have to find the appropriate group. Um, the fact that you see the tumor in multiple studies from different laboratories strengthens, it's, it's one of the criteria we were looking at in EPA's cancer guidelines, it strengthens the um, belief that this is a positive finding. And uh, just to sort of tie the loop back, Remember earlier we gave that example of the Wood study from 2009? Yes. Is that it right there? That's it right there. Correct. And we actually specifically discussed the malignant lymphoma finding, right? That's correct. And what we have here is the trend, the dose, and the M, and three pluses. Can you explain to the jury what that means? Uh, in this case, um, you've seen the data. There was indeed a statistically significant trend in the data. In fact, it was less than 0.01 was the probability, I told you it was 0.007 out of, seven out of a thousand, and that is in the highly significant uh, group. The highest dose was, in fact, significantly different from the control group, and so I circled dose here, and it was only in males, it was not in females. Okay, great. So I don't want to spend 
all day going through all the different findings that you have here. Um, but I, I do want to take a step, well, I want to focus on a few more just so we can understand what they're about. Um, I want to look at this yellow box under wood. Uh, uh, multiple malignant tumors or neoplasms. Do you see that? Yes. What's that, that refer to? So that was an analysis they did in the wood study where they looked to see how many malignancies there were per animal in the study. And they looked to see if that was increasing with exposure in the study. So they did a trend test through that, and they found that to be statistically significant trend in the males. So with males, male animals, as you go up in exposure, the, each animal is more likely to have multiple malignant tumors. And we have uh, another multiple malignant finding in the Sujimoto 1997 study. Do you see that? 1987, is that right? Sorry, it's 1997? 97, yes. Okay. And if you go down here, there's a lot of different tumors, but we get down to the multiple malignant tumors. you see that? Yes. And this one, it, 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 the, the, so you have a significant, a highly significant trend, that a highly correct. significant dose, and in males. This, this one has a highly significant trend. I don't know about the highly significant dose. I did not put the pluses for the dose test, um, but it is in males. Fair enough. The pluses in, on here are strictly for the trend test. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, all right. Well, taking a step back and looking at all, all these studies, um, we have all these tumors, and we've color-coded the tumors to match up, right? So we have the kidney ones in light blue. Do you see that? Yes. And uh, we have this pink one that appears in four of the five studies. Correct. That's referring to malignant lymphoma. Is that right? That's correct. Um, what, if any, significance is there that in four of the five mouse studies you have malignant lymphoma findings? Again, it's, it speaks to the consistency of the finding across multiple studies in multiple laboratories. Um, two of those, both the 18-month studies, both the most recent mouse studies, um, are significant in and of themselves in each of the two studies and the other two are marginally significant. Um, it basically says that this chemical is causing these tumors in mice. Where was the findings of these, of these tumors? What type of mice were they found in? Um, CD1 mice for the three, for the Atkinson, Sujimoto, and Wood, and then the Swiss-Webster mouse. And what were their genders? All males. Does that have any significance, significance to you? Um, it's, it's simply, again, repeating the finding uh, from study to study. The fact that you don't see it in females, you do see it in males, speaks to a consistency of the actual finding itself. Now, uh, it's almost impossible to see, and I apologize because of the colors. We have this dark purple one here in Sujimoto. Um, see if we can get in close enough to read it. It's hemangiomas. You see that? Yes. Okay, and, and recognizing that it was hard to read, I see you wrote it to the side here, is that right? Correct. Okay, and so what did you find for the hemangiomas in this study? Well, there was a highly significant trend uh, in hemangiomas. It's in females, and females only, um, and there were no dose-related <coughs> effects by themselves. Uh, so we're looking at the Kumar study? Correct. Is this the same strain of mice? No, it is not. Okay. If we go down, we have the hemangioma uh, finding. Is that what I'm seeing here? That is what you were seeing there. And what did you find? Here we found a highly significant trend, um, increasing hemangiomas in females with an increasing exposure to glyphosate, uh, and only in females, not in males. And this finding between Sujimoto and Kumar, what significance is there to that? Um, Oh, again, it's, it's, you're, you're seeing the same tumor in uh, multiple studies, in this case, two different laboratories, in this case, two different strains of mice. Um, that adds to the overall finding that this is probably a positive finding. You don't see it in wood, um, but these hemangiomas, um, I'd have to go back and look at the wood study to see why, but my recollection is that wood saw none. Um, uh, this is a very... Uh, rare tumor, and so that doesn't really subtract from the fact that you found it in the other study. Again, it's a highly significant finding. Now, looking at all, the, all these tumors in these mice studies, which ones to you are the most compelling findings 
when you're assessing whether or not glyphosate can cause cancer? The kidney carcinomas and adenomas are important. They, they're repeated. Uh, even though they're marginal, they're rare tumors. And as we saw with EPA's guidelines, when you see rare tumors occurring, you, you, you perk up and look at it very carefully. Um, I, I think those are clearly caused by glyphosate here. The malignant lymphomas, I have no doubt in my mind that they are caused by uh, glyphosate here. It's especially obvious in the 18-month studies. Um, one you didn't mention were hemangiosarcomas in males. Um, you saw it in one of the 24-month studies in the Atkinson study. It's highly significant. When you look at the 18-month study, the hemangiosarcomas are significant. But in 18 months, the historical controls, 26 historical control groups, um, there were no hemangiosarcomas ever seen uh, in 18 months. So that's a highly significant finding, biologically important. Um, and uh, that's quite obvious. Um, so I think the hemangiosarcomas are important, and the hemangiomas that we just talked about in the females are important findings as well. And just so we close the loop on this, this Atkinson uh, study has the word limited in yellow. Do you see that? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't explain that. Well, Would what you like me to explain that? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, so the Atkinson study is different than the other studies because they didn't look at all of the animals um, by taking slices of the tissues. Um, they, they did something cheaper, less expensive, um, which was popular at the time. I don't want to think they, they were doing something very, very unusual. Several groups were exploring the possibility, including the National Toxicology Program, of reducing the amount of pathology due. The idea would be that you do the control group and you do the high dose group, you do the entire evaluation, and then anything you see that's important in those two groups, you only look at those tissues in the interior groups. Um, and so that's what Atkinson did. Um, it turned out Atkinson didn't think any of the tumors were important, so he didn't do any of the tissues in the intermediate groups except liver, lung, and kidney, which they had decided to do in advance, that they would look at those tissues uh, in advance no matter what they saw. So there are a bunch of animals in these studies that even though it, the Atkinson stu study is multiple dose groups, it's really only a two-dose group study, high-dose control. And even though in Atkinson, they didn't look at lymphomas in the middle groupings. Is there any significance to still having a lymphoma finding here? Well, lymphomas are uh, not really, okay? To be fair here, Lym lymphomas are very aggressive tumors. Uh, you're going to find them. Um, even if you don't do pathology on every single tissue, you are going to find a malignant lymphoma if it's there. Um, uh, they're quite obvious from a pathological point of view. So for malignant lymphomas, the proper denominator is probably all of the 50 animals, or 51 animals that were in each of the dose groups from Atkinson because you would find them. Okay. And so it would be fair to say then that even though Atkinson was limited, uh, it, it doesn't affect your opinion of the malignant lymphoma finding. Correct. Or the hemangiosarcomas because it's the same thing. They are blood-based tumors. And you find them typically by seeing a, a tumor. Okay. Let's turn to exhibit 883, which is the, 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 the rat chart. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, sir, but as you can, uh, maybe you can, but the, the last three studies are on a different shade than the first four studies. Do you see that? That's correct. Okay. They what does that be. signify? Um, the first four studies were done in sprayed dolly rats, one strain of rat. The second, the last three studies were done in Wistar rats, a completely different strain of rat. And I notice up here you have uh, numbers written. What do those reflect? Number of months on study. So the Lancus study was 26 months exposure in the rats, and all of the other studies are 24 months of exposure. Okay. <laughs> and then um, you also have a little key down here. Is this the same plus chart we did from the previous one? That is correct. Okay. And then we have um, uh, two of these studies say limited at Atkinson. I mean, I'm confused. Atkinson was in the mouse study. Why is, there, why is it on the rat chart? Uh, as I pointed out earlier, typically these studies are rats and mice, males and females. So Atkinson managed both sets of studies, rats and mice, males <laughs> and females. 
You'll see also there's a wood 2009. Uh, there was a wood 2009 in the mouse. Um, wood managed both of those studies. They were done in the same laboratory. Um, so it's, that's not unusual to see. And limited means exactly the same thing here. Um, Atkinson in their rat study also did that same limited pathology. Suresh in 1996 also did the same basic limited pathology. Okay. And, uh, and Suresh, uh, unlike all the other studies, uh, you didn't find any significant tumor findings. That's correct. Suresh had absolutely nothing that appeared to be positive in the entire study. Okay. Um, so I want to go through a few of these, but let's just use the, the first one as just an example to sort of make sure we're reading it correctly. So this Lankis study from 1981, is that right? Correct. And trend, dose, male, three pluses, what does that mean? So um, again, this is um, highly statistically significant trend increase in these interstitial cell tumors in testicles in these spray dolly rats after 26 months of exposure. The highest dose or one of the dose groups was statistically significant from the controls and these are testicles so it only occurred in the males. Um, one thing about this study is that the doses in this study were significantly lower than all of the other studies here by a factor of at least 10 for the, even the lowest dose in the other studies. Um, um, making this a very unusual study to have seen positive findings. But it is 26 months, so they went a little bit longer. And so your question earlier about 70-year-old people, um, this one's into that range. And so it's possible they're picking up things that other studies would not pick up because they went a little longer. This testicular interstitial cell tumor finding is in no other study. Uh, it's a unique study by itself, but it's a very strong finding. And if we look, just sticking to Lankes, we have thyroid C-cell carcinomas or adenomas and pancreatic islet cell tumors. Do you see that? Correct. And uh, those are just, again, types of tumors that are studied? Is That's that right? correct. The, the, the unique thing here is the pancreatic islet cell tumors, there is no dose response trend there. There's only a significant finding of one of the groups to the control group. The two pluses there refer to that pairwise comparison, not the trend. Gotcha. So there's no trend in that one that is positive. The thyroid C-cell carcinomas were in females, and that was a marginally significant finding. And if we look at the next study, uh, Stout and Rucker, 1990, uh, we again see the thyroid one. Do you see that? Correct. Sure. And what is this reflection that there's both M and F circled? So this is again um, the same tumors, thyroid C-cell carcinomas or adenomas combined. Um, when you look at thyroid C-cell carcinomas here for the females, it's significant all by itself, but I decided to present the combined analysis here. Um, the trend test is marginally significant for both males and females, and for females, one of the dose groups is significantly different from the controls. And then we see this pancreatic islet cell tumors. Do you see that? Correct. Again, the same tumor as before, but, and this time there's still no trend, you see a single dose group increased against the controls, and it's males again. And this is essentially the same finding? Exactly the same finding. Okay. Or same kind of finding. And they seem to be pop, well, how many times do they pop up in these studies? Um, three times in the Sprague Dolly rats and once in the Wistar rats. And what kind of tumor is that? A skin keratoacanthoma is a skin tumor. Um, it's typically a benign skin tumor, although in, it can become malignant. Um, it's not usually malignant, but it, it, it can become malignant. In some species, it is highly malignant, depending upon the, the rat species, rat strain you're looking at. Um, but yeah, it's a skin cancer. Um, what else? That's that, that answers my question. Um, uh, are you familiar with the term oncogenicity? Yes, I am familiar with that term. What does that mean? Uh, oncogenicity means, um, uh, it, same as carcinogenicity, it's the ability to cause cancer. Um, and specifically, does it relate to tumor formation? Yes. Okay. Um, the fact that you're seeing um, the skin carrot, I can't say that phrase. Keratoacanthoma. Okay. The fact that you're seeing so many of those in different studies, 
does that lend or not lend support to, to glyphosate being oncogenic? Oh, that lends support. Just because the tumor is benign doesn't mean it isn't uh, um, an important oncogenic finding. So yes, it does lend credence to that. Um, it's quite clear that it's causing these skin keratoacanthomas uh, in these rat studies. It's the fact that it's appearing in three of the four spray dolly rat studies um, is an important finding. I don't remember what it was in Lankus. I did evaluate it. It's in my expert report, but I don't think the Lankus study made a big difference um, in uh, what you were seeing here. I, I think this is quite clear. Now, if we look at uh, Enomoto, which is the middle study from 1997, we have uh, a blue box. Do you see that? Yes. What is this referring to? So again, we're looking at kidney carcinomas or adenomas, the same we saw as in the CD1 mice. Uh, there's a significant trend only in males, and it's highly significant. Its p-value is less than 0.01. So if we just go back to the, the, the mice chart briefly, we have kidney carcinomas in Knesvich and Hogan and Sujimoto. And that, what kind of mice is that? Sujimoto is the uh, CD1 mouse. And then we have another finding in Kumar. What kind of mouse was that? Uh, Kumar mouse is, is a Swiss Webster mouse. And now we're into another species altogether, and we have another finding. Uh, what kind of mouse, was, what kind of rat was that? That's a sprayed dolly rat. What is the significance of seeing this popping up across species and across strains? Well, when you're, when you're looking at cancer bioassay data, one thing that strengthens the, the belief that the chemical can cause, I'm using a very general term. So I might say um, glyphosate causes malignant lymphomas in CD1 mice, okay? Um, that's a very specific statement about a specific tumor. But you also have a general statement about, you know, is it possible in mammalian systems for glyphosate to cause cancer? And since these are controlled studies, we'd like to be able to say, in rodents, in rats and mice, uh, does glyphosate cause cancer? So when you're trying to answer that bigger question, there are things like in the EPA evaluation you'd like to see. Um, multiple studies with the same tumor, multiple studies with the same tumor in different species. That strengthens that finding for that tumor, and it strengthens that overall call that glyphosate can, is oncogenic, if you want to use that oncogenic term. It can cause cancer of some sort in mammalian systems. And so on that big question, when I see kidney tumors in sprayed dolly rats, CD1 mice, and Swiss Webster mice, from the same chemical, that strengthens the finding that chemical is oncogenic. How long have you been involved in these exact type of rodent studies? Oh, 40 years. When you look at all of these tumor data, in the rats and in the mice, what is your conclusion about whether or not glyphosate can cause cancer in animals? There is no doubt in my mind that glyphosate can cause tumors in laboratory animals. Um, there's just no doubt. But hold on a second. How does that relate to humans then? Well, most human, in fact, all human carcinogens that are chemical carcinogens um, have been shown to be carcinogenic in um, some sort of laboratory animal. So you've got half of it. Um, that's the question of sensitivity. Are animal models sensitive enough to find human carcinogens? Yes. Uh, every human carcinogen has been seen in at least one animal model. Um, you don't have the specificity. Just because it's in the animal model doesn't mean it's in humans. So it tells you to be worried about the human system. Uh, it's part of the overall evaluation. It's not enough to be absolutely certain this is going to cause cancer in humans. But the fact that you can see it causing cancer in mammals that are 95% genomically similar to humans um, raises concerns and raises the bar to um, uh, have concern about the carcinogenicity, oncogenicity of this particular compound. And before a product is approved, um, like glyphosate, um, are these types of studies required? In the United States, they are definitely required. Um, 
All right, so I want to go back to exhibit uh, 880. This is our, uh, our, our cancer stool that we've put together, our causation stool that we've put together. And we spent the morning so far uh, discussing animal studies, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, I want to move on to the next topic, which is uh, mechanism studies, all right? Okay. Um, but you know what, before we do that, let's take a short break. Okay. We were looking at this stool here on animal studies, and so far the animal studies we've looked at, were they looking at glyphosate or glyphosate formulations? The studies that we've looked at were looking at glyphosate alone. What Pure is the, glyphosate. What is the difference between glyphosate and a glyphosate formulation? I, I am in no way, shape, or form an expert on that, but um, roughly, Good. from my rough understanding, glyphosate formulations have other chemicals in them to help get the glyphosate into the plants and do other things that are necessary to make the glyphosate effective as a herbicide. And to be clear, when we talk about the animal studies here, um, uh, we've been talking so far about glyphosate, is that right? That is correct. Um, when we talk about mechanism studies, uh, are we talking about just glyphosate or both? Both. There are mechanism studies which are pure glyphosate and mechanism studies which are glyphosate formulations. And when we talk about epidemiology, are we talking about technical glyphosate or the formulation? Uh, human studies are all um, technical glyphosate. The, the formulations, sorry. The, the formulations. Um, yes, the humans are exposed to only the formulations. And is that, why is that? Why are humans exposed to the formulated product? Well, because th these are not controlled studies, experimental studies in humans. These are humans who are working or, or living near fields that are sprayed with glyphosate who get uh, ancillary exposure. Um, and so they're being exposed to the commercial product, which is the formulation. Okay. Um, earlier in your testimony, you talked about something called an initiation and promoter study. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. What is an initiator and prom promoter study? Um, so, I, I do have a graphic on this. Would you like to look at the graphic and I can walk through that? Sure. Uh, do you want to look at the carcinogenesis? Yes. Okay, the great. The mechanism graphic, because that is, pertains to the initiation promotion study. Okay. Um, uh, this thing would be great, the, the trial pad. Uh, in your binder is uh, page 88. Well, I'll just put it up on the screen. You tell me if this is what you're looking for. Is this what you're looking for? Yes, 885, it says. Okay, great. This is exhibit 885. Um, using this diagram, explain to us what an initiation and promoter study is. So this is a diagram, missing one line, of how um, cells go from being normal working cells to becoming cancerous cells. It, it's a very simple picture of the overall process. It's a multi-stage process. So cells don't go from being normal to cancer all in one shot. They go through a, a series of events that generally lead to a carcinogenic finding. The first part, you've got a whole bunch of normal cells. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're happy, they're functioning, they're going along just fine. Something happens, either something comes in or just normal to the cells, the DNA gets damaged. And there's supposed to be a line between normal cells to damaged cells, which somehow has disappeared. There That's you go. That's true line. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden now, instead of all these normal cells, you've got a bunch of normal cells, and in the middle of them is one damaged cell. It's got a DNA that's different than the rest. Is that this picture right here that you're referring Second to? Second picture. Right here? Um, yes. Okay. Now, the cell has a lot of machinery that can repair that DNA damage. Um, and generally that happens when a cell replicates, but it can happen at any time. But it tries to repair that damage, and if it repairs it, fixes the DNA, then it's the same DNA as everybody else, and you go back to being a happy tissue with all the cells functioning in the right way. If when the cell replicates, it doesn't fix that DNA repair, then if you remember from high school biology, DNA is two strands. They wrap around each other like this, you know. When cells replicate, they break the strands, and then the individual strands replicate again, so that you get two strands. 
Well, if this one's damaged, the sequence is different than that one, when it replicates, it replicates the damage. So now it's got a change sequence over the other one. That's a mutation. So now that cell is a mutated cell. So in this diagram, is that right here in the mutated cells? Correct. That okay. That cell is very unlikely to be able to go back and become normal. It's going to remain being a mutated cell. And that process can repeat itself over and over again. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Oh, uh, the next slide. That one, correct, 885. To the, the next page? Oh, I'm sorry, next page. Okay. I think it's the, the there should I be another it. one. I have it. It's 889 or 890. Is that it? Correct. Now okay. you're looking at um, how external things can affect this process. So a chemical, which is the thing at the bottom, there you go, chemicals can come in and change the rate at which cells get DNA damage. So the chemical itself can damage the cell or it can change the functioning of the cell such that the damage is not repaired appropriately, but whatever the case, a chemical by changing that rate can increase the probability of a mutation. So let me just slow you down there. So we have on this diagram here this chemical, is that what you're referring to? Correct. And then you're saying it can affect actual DNA damage? Correct. It can affect replication? Correct. And it can affect the uncontrolled growth? Uh, it can affect several things. But if it affects oxidative stress, or DNA damage, genotoxicity, or it affects DNA repair down here, or it affects cellular replication without DNA repair, if it affects any of those three things adversely, then you can get an increased risk of a mutation. Okay. Okay? So, hold on. You're using a lot of terms here. We've got to define them all. Oxidative stress, what's that? Um, so, oxygen is common to cells. We breathe oxygen. There's a reason for it. We need it. It's, it's, the inner, it's part of the energy that drives our bodies. Um, oxygen typically likes to bind to things, but when it's not bound, it's, it's wanting to bind to something. So think of it as a magnet next to metal. It wants to bind to the metal. Um, that's an oxygen radical. It's, it's not quite balanced because it isn't bound to anything. Um, oxidative stress means that your cell has more oxygen radicals, unbound <coughs> oxygen, than it normally should have. It's higher than it should be. And you can cause that in a number of ways, one of which is through chemical exposures. Okay. So... And when that oxygen, that free oxygen, is running around and not bound to things it should bind to, it binds to things it shouldn't bind to, like DNA. And when it binds to DNA or parts of the, trans to the machinery that works with DNA, it can affect the whole system and mess it up. Okay. We're going to talk a lot more about oxidative stress and uh, DNA damage later. But for now, how does this relate to that where we started, initiation and promotion studies? So that's what I wanted to get to. In toxicology chemical parlance, if a chemical causes an increase in mutations, it's called an initiator. So it is starting the chemical process, it's the, the cancer process, it is initiating the process. If the chemical comes in and enhances the process, so it takes something that's already started and makes it go faster, then it's called a promoter. It's promoting something that's already going on. So, an initiator causes this mutation. A promoter enhances that mutation and makes it even come out more later to come be, get more cancers. So an initiation promotion study is one where you take a chemical that's an initiator, you give it to the animal for a short period of time, hopefully causing the startup mutations in the animals, and then you come with another chemical, a promoter, and you give it for a longer period of time, and that enhances that in mutation, and you begin to see the cancers. So a classical initiation promoter study is used to try to understand some basic mechanisms of chemicals and causing cancer. If I have a chemical that I think might be an initiator, then I do a study where I give the animal that chemical for a short period of time, and then I, there are known promoters, 
that we already know exist. And so then I give those same animals a promoter for a period of time and look to see if I see more cancers. If I do, then this was probably an initiator, the chemical I'm looking at. If I don't, then it's probably not an initiator, in this system at least. If I think the chemical's a promoter, then I give a classic initiator, initiator something I already know will cause mutations. And then I follow it with this new chemical for a period of time and look to see if I see cancers. Okay, if you don't know anything about the chemical, you do both. You give it as an initiator with a classic promoter, you give it as a promoter with a classic initiator and you see what happens. The George study, the one remaining study, is an initiation promotion study with glyphosate. Okay, stop right there. Let me ask you some questions. Okay. All right, let's talk about the George study. Um, if you turn to your binder to 559. Okay. Is that a fair and accurate copy of the George study? Um, yes, it is. Okay, great. So now it's up on the screen. And I, I just want to walk through a little bit what, what this says and ask you what it means. So the title of the document is Studies on Glyphosate-Induced Carcinogenicity in Mouse Skin, a Proteomic Approach. Um, what does that mean? Um, it's proteomic. Okay. <laughs> um, so the key words here, it's glyphosate. They're looking for carcinogenicity. The study is not being done like the ones we looked at. This is done on mouse skin. So instead of the mice eating the glyphosate, it's painted onto their skin. Um, a proteomic approach means that they're going to look at uh, changes in proteins in the skin at the end of the study. Okay, great. Um, and in this study, uh, it, it reads, glyphosate is a widely used broad-spectrum herbicide reported to induce various toxic effects in non-target species, but its carcinogenic potential is still unknown. Here we showed the carcinogenic effects of glyphosate using two-stage mouse skin carcinogenesis model and proteomic analysis. Carcinogenicity study revealed that glyphosate has a tumor-promoting activity. Can you translate what I just read into English? <laughs> Um, the first sentence is, is obvious in their opinion. The second sentence deals with what they call a two-stage mouse skin carcinogenesis model. That is initiation, promotion. First stage is initiation. Second stage is promotion. It's in the mouse skin. So they call that a two-stage mouse carcinogenicity study. Um, proteomic analysis is much more complicated. Okay. And then it says carcinogenicity study revealed that glyphosate uh, has tumor promoting activity. What does that mean? It means in this two stage model where you give a known initiator and follow it with glyphosate for a fixed period of time, you see more skin tumors, in this case they are skin papillomas, than you would normally see and so the glyphosate is promoting out the tumors that were started with the initiator. All right. Now I just want to turn to the second page here. Uh, this is, it says materials and methods. Do you see that? Yes. It says the commercial formulation of the herbicide glyphosate, Roundup Original, copyright glyphosate 41%, POEA 15%, Monsanto Company, St. Louis, Missouri was used. Um, is that your understanding in the study? Yes, that's, that's the compound that was being painted on the animals. So this is this different than um, pure technical glyphosate? Yes, this is different than pure technical glyphosate. And then we have here uh, all these different treatment groups, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you see group one, group two, group three, do you see that? Yes. And the one that I'm interested in is... Um, This group seven, or group eight, I'm sorry. It says DMBA plus glyphosate, single topical application of DMBA, followed one week later by topical treatment of glyphosate. Do you see that? 
Correct. What is that referring to? DMBA, DMBA is a chemical. It's a known initiator. So they're, they're initiating the skin with DMBA and following it with glyphosate applications um, three times per week, 25 milligrams per kilogram body weight on the backs of the mice. And if we go to the results, uh, it's on table one. Um, and we see here that that group, group eight, the DMBA plus glyphosate, uh, how, what percentage of the animals had tumors in their skin? Um, eight out of 20 animals had um, papillomas on their backs. And, and what percentage is that? Uh, six, uh, let's see, uh, 40%. Okay. And if you look at uh, uh, the rest of the, the results, the only other one that had tumors in the skin was group three. What does that reflect? Group three is the what's called a positive control in this study. Um, DMBA, the same initiator as they used with glyphosate, plus TPA. Um, TPA is a known promoter, um, very strong promoter, so that um, uh, you would expect to see lots of tumors, and there they're seeing tumors in all the animals. Okay. And if you look down here, there's, a, there's an asterisk on the group eight, the glyphosate group, you see that? Yes. And then it says p-value less than 0.5. Do you see that? Yes. Versus untreated group? Yes. You mentioned p-values earlier. In, in as, as simple as terms as you can, what is a p-value? It's the probability that the observation you're seeing agrees with uh, no effect. So in this case, it's the probability that there's no increase in tumors from glyphosate being used as a promoter in this study. Um, if that probability is very small, you reject the hypothesis that there's no increase in favor of an of a alternative that there, in fact, is an increase. So with this being a statistically significant result, what does that show you as a scientist? That it's possible glyphosate is a promoter of carcinogenesis. And in this context, we're talking about commercial roundup. Correct. All right, so let's, let's go back, uh, well, let's go back to this rat study, if you go back to the document camera. Um, you know, in this rat study, we have these repeated findings of skin tumors. You see that? Yes. Yeah. What, if anything, does this indicate to you as a, as a scientist? Uh, in terms of the relationship to the skin painting study that was mm -hmm. done, um, I, it would be far too speculative for me to, to go there. Okay. Um, in one case, they're papillomas. These are skin keratoacanthomas. Um, they're different mouse strains. Um, the other study is very tailored for, the initiation promotion study is very tailored for a very fixed result. Um, I, I, it would be too speculative for me to say they're, just, they're related in any way. Okay. Well, then let me ask you this question. The, the George study, this positive finding there, um, what, what is that consistent with what you're seeing in the rodent data for glyphosate? Um, partially. The, obviously, it's, it's addressing the question of promotion, which means that you already have these initiated cells. Um, living can cause mutations to occur, and so it's conceivable that glyphosate, all of these tumor findings we are seeing here, are glyphosate promoting out already effects I don't think it's likely, but it's conceivable that's the case. The, the initiation promotion study is simply showing you that uh, in one system, the skin, um, glyphosate has this ability to promote out cancer. That's all it really means. Well, let's hypothetically speaking, let's say an individual has a mutated cell caused by, like you said, life or like a viral infection or something. Um, does the George study what, I don't know, you tell me, does it have any influence on whether or not it could promote a mutation to lead to cancer? It certainly increases the chances that that might be the case because now you have evidence to suggest glyphosate can do this. this. Um, but I'd want to see a lot more evidence before I'd go there and start thinking about that. Um, there are initiation promotion studies you can do in the liver. There are initiation promotion studies you can do in the brain. 
Um, I'd like to see a little more uh, work along those lines. And then looking at the other mechanistic evidence, I'd, I'd have to conclude that um, even though it wasn't an initiator in the skin, I'd want to look more closely at why it didn't come out as an initiator in the skin because theoretically it probably should have. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you'd like to see more initiation and promotion studies and other sort of organs. Um, have any of those been done? Not that I'm aware of. I would have hopefully picked them up in my search of the literature and I haven't seen any. Okay. All right, so going back to our, our, our causation stool here, we spent some time on animal studies and we talked about the initiation and promotion study and that kind of got us into this next section which is the mechanism studies. We're talking about the mechanistic studies. Uh, how many known mechanisms are there uh, between a known carcinogen and it causing cancer? Depends how you want to break that down, but um, we recently wrote a paper that looks at 10 different um, classes, let's call them classes of mechanisms, that we think uh, relate to starting the carcinogenesis process or chemically modifying the carcinogenesis process. And for the purposes of glyphosate, uh, how many have you looked at closely? Two of those have sufficient data for us to really evaluate them for glyphosate. And what are those two? Um, one is DNA damage, causing DNA damage. The other is oxidative stress. And when you say DNA damage, is, is another term for that uh, genotoxicity? Yeah, that is another term for it. Although genotoxicity can go beyond DNA damage. DNA damage is a subclass of the fuller class of genotoxicity. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I, I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, when you look at this cancer causation stool that we're talking about here, um, how important are the mechanistic studies in your view? Well, I was going to get back to your stool. <laughs> um, because the stool seems to imply that if you don't have one of these legs, the whole thing falls down. Um, that's not true here. Um, having a mechanism strengthens the other data in terms of supporting a carcinogenic finding. Not knowing the mechanism um, doesn't subtract. It simply leaves a, a question mark in your head about, well, how strong is this? So it may, you won't have as strong of a finding, but you'll still have the finding there. Um, there are a number of interesting carcinogens which the mechanism was worked out until long after we were absolutely certain it was happening because um, we just couldn't figure it out. But here with glyphosate, have we figured out some mechanisms? We have indications of processes that support uh, a mechanism that probably would work for glyphosate. I would not go far as, so far as to say I'm absolutely certain this is exactly how the mechanism occurs. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely certain it does certain things and that those things can lead to a carcinogenic finding, but I'm not absolutely certain that those mechanisms are the ones that are driving the carcinogenic finding for glyphosate. Okay, well let's talk about the two, the two that we've looked at. The first one was uh, genotoxicity. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, exhibit 886 in your binder. This is a picture uh, that we've put together to help explain genotoxicity. Is that right? Yes, that's okay. not what's on the screen. But I, I, I just want you to verify it, and then I'll put it on the screen. That's a specific type of genetic damage, DNA damage. Perfect. So we have this picture up here, and I just kind of want to walk the jury through what we're seeing here. So on the first thing, we have a single strand break. What's that referring to? Oh, you've got a, yeah, I, I now see you've got a whole bunch of different types of DNA damage here. Um, single strand break means, um, like I said, DNA is double twisted, this helix. So what you're looking at here with the, the, the bands of ribbon going around is a, a, a a picture of what looks like DNA. A single strand break means you went in with something like a scissor and you cut one of the DNA strands. Is that this area that I'm referring to? Yes. Okay. And then we have mismatch. Do you see that? Correct. What's that refer to? Um, so 
DNA has these chemicals in it. There are four basic chemicals. And they tend to complement each other. On if one strand of DNA has, let, let's give them letters. One is an A, one is a T, the two chemicals. If this strand of DNA has an A on it, the other strand of DNA will have a T on it. And they match together and they bind, and that's what makes this sort of ladder effect going up the DNA. But sometimes when the cell tries to repair itself, to repair the DNA, it mismatches. And so instead of putting an A across from a T, there may be another chemical uh, molecule in the cell called G, let's call it that, and it's a G and a T, and they don't exactly fit together. So that's a mismatch, and that happens with repair. That's a known DNA damage, mismatch repair. All right, and we have all these different other mechanisms. Correct. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I want to talk about these crosslinks. What do these crosslinks refer to? So instead of the A and the T matching each other across the DNA, instead this T matches to that T and they, they bind on the same DNA and the two on the bottom might bind or not bind. So you're, you're cross-linking within a single strand of DNA instead of across the DNA. Okay. And then down here we have a, a photograph or a picture of a micronucleus. What is that? So when you have some of these types of DNA damage, um, when the cell goes in to try to repair it, um, it ends up cutting off a piece of DNA and it pulls it off to the side and you get these little micronuclei which indicate that DNA damage has been repaired. Um, the more micronuclei you have, the more chances are that you have DNA damage that's unrepaired. So people measure micronuclei as a means of measuring potential DNA damage. All right. So when we look at the, these different types of genetic damage, um, are there different tests that measure different types of genetic damage? Uh, yes, there are. They're, they're, they can get very specific in terms of doing the, the types of damage you want to look at. Um, uh, yeah, there are tests. Okay. All right, I want to, um, uh, I've prepared a, a sort of a demonstrative to help us walk through sort of understanding genotoxicity data. This is exhibit 887. Um, and uh, I want to sort of break things down for the jury, okay? So um, are you familiar with the terms in vivo and in vitro? Oh, yes, I am. What do they refer to? In vivo we mean, re refers to in the living organism, in vivetum or whatever, it's a, it's a um, Latin term, um, living organism. All right, I wrote, I wrote living there, to, and in vitro refers to what? Um, in cells. Okay, and is that often called a petri dish? Well, it's in cells independent of the living organism. So I'll put cells. Yeah. Okay, great. And that can be in a petri dish or in a... a um, flask or whatever. Test tube or something? Test tube. Okay. So we have in vivo and in vitro. Uh, are, there, are there different types of tests that were done? Uh, yes. You, okay. you, wouldn't you wouldn't generally do the same test in living organisms that you do in uh, cells in, an, in a petri dish. All right. And then these different types of tests, are they done on glyphosate and formulation? They can be. Okay. And in the data that you reviewed, have there been generally studies done uh, on glyphosate and formulations? Correct, both in vivo and in vitro. All right. Okay. So then within the in vivo studies and the in vitro studies, are there studies done on different types of species? Yes, absolutely. How would you categorize those, those groups? Well, there are in vivo studies in humans. Okay. There are in vivo studies in other mammals. And then there are in vivo studies in um, uh, other animals and other things that are not mammals. So that can include bacteria and uh, salmonella stuff as well as fish and uh, other things. All other right. animals slash other stuff. I wrote other non-mammals. Is that okay? That's fine. 
Okay, great. So it looks like then, when you look at the data here, there's in vivo, in vitro, glyphosate, and formulations, and then the three categories of species in both of, all four of those. Right, because you can derive cells from humans, you can derive cells from mammals that are not humans, and you can derive cells from other mammals. The main difference, the only one is that in the in vitro side, you can also have single cellular organisms. Oh, okay. Like bacteria, which okay. you wouldn't put in the in vivo living side of it. All right, so I put on bacteria as well. Okay, okay great. Um, for the purposes of sort of understanding the mechanism of, of carcinogenesis for glyphosate, what categories of species and for, uh, formulation of glyphosate is the most helpful for understanding? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. If, if you're wanting to just look at glyphosate, if, if I wanted to address the question, is glyphosate carcinogenic? then obviously I want to look at the glyphosate studies. Um, it, regardless, whether it's glyphosate or a formulation, I would rank human in vivo studies number one. Uh, that would clearly get my greatest attention because those studies are in the right organism um, and they're in the living organism. Number two is a little tougher to call because in vitro studies in human cells are the right organism, but they're in cells in a petri dish, so it's kind of removed from the human situation, the full working human situation. But still, human cells in, um, in a petri dish. On the other hand, if I study mammals, it's in a living organism. Um, and so that's closer to a living, breathing human being than cells in a petri dish. So it's hard for me to rank those two other than say, I'm going to consider them both about the same importance. So okay. they would both get my two, number two ranking. And then everything else is, is falling down below that. Um, cellular studies in, in um, mammals are interesting and important, um, but they're not as interesting and important as the human cellular studies. Other mammals, or other non-mammal animals, uh, studies in them are important, but because they're so far removed from the human experience, they're less important than mammals that are closer to humans. Well, what about, uh, for example, the number one, in vivo human studies? Uh, so living people um, studies. Uh, are there different levels of importance relative to what you're studying in the human? Yes, yes. Um, different studies carry different quality of, of information. Um, I, I'm going to go to a slightly different subject for a second to, to illustrate this. Tobacco's a good example. So there's all kinds of different studies about smoking. One of the most important smoking studies that was ever done to really honestly prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that smoking can cause lung cancer was a study with doctors in the UK and what they did was they got the doctors to quit smoking some and some didn't and what they were able to prove was that when doctors quit smoking their lung cancer rates were lower than the doctors who continued to smoke so you could show the doctors who smoked got cancer at a certain rate you could show that doctors who never smoked got cancer at another rate. And then you can show that doctors who quit smoking, their cancer risk went almost back down to the non-smokers if they quit early enough. And that's a really strong study because you've intervened in a human population and shown that your intervention makes a big difference. Now, I can't do a study where I force people to smoke and force some people not to smoke and control everything else and have them smoke. So I can't do that. But I can do these intervention studies. We don't have that here, but that's a strong study. There are also weaker studies than even the one where you look at smokers versus non-smokers. There are studies where you look at um, Russians smoke more than Americans. Let's look at Russian lung cancer versus American lung cancer. That type of study is a much more weaker study, so it depends on the type of study you're looking at. Did you want to say something else? This is discussed in my expert report, 
with the tobacco example and, and references. What about uh, the, the actual organs and cells that you're looking at? I mean, does that influence your understanding of sure. the study? The, when, you, when you do these in vitro studies, or, and even in the in vivo studies, yes, it matters which target, which organs and cells you're looking at. And so we're here to talk about glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What would be the best thing to look at for whether or not mechanistically they're causing lymphoma? Well, you'd think you'd want to look at human systems and you'd want to look at uh, hematopoietic cells, so cells that make up the blood, the, the, the lymphatic system, um, and there's a whole variety of cells that play a role in that system. Okay. So turning to our sort of data over here on genotoxicity, are there any pure glyphosate in vivo human studies? No, there are not. Are there any formulation in vivo human studies that look at genetic damage? Uh, yes, there are. Okay, and how many studies have looked at that? There are three studies that I'm aware of. And one study was, uh, who were they done by? Two of them were done by a, a researcher whose last name is Pazzi Muno. Uh, and the third was done by a researcher called Bolognese. All right, let's start off with Dr. Pazzi Muno. Okay. Um, uh, what did that study show? The first study by Pazzi Muno was like my Russian versus U.S. study. Um, he looked at, or she, I, I actually don't know, um, Dr. Pazzi Muno looked at a, a, a group of people who lived near an area that was sprayed with, gly with a glyphosate formulation and another group of people who lived 80 kilometers away in an area that didn't experience any um, uh, spraying. Uh, they asked questions to make sure there weren't other obvious things in the environment that might explain a difference. And then they went in and took blood from those people in both locations and looked for DNA damage in the peripher in that blood uh, of those people, I think it was in lymphocytes, and they saw a significant difference with the people living near the sprayed area having more uh, DNA damage than those living further away. And non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is, is that a blood cancer? It's a cancer of the hemopoietic system. Yes, it's part of that whole system. Um, did Dr. Did Dr. Pazzi Muno, Muno uh, do a follow-up study with these people? He did a follow-up study, I don't think it's the same exact people, but he did a follow-up study um, and looked later instead of soon after spraying, looked at multiple times after spraying and didn't see the, um, the same effect. It disappeared. How much later did he look at it? Um, I think it was a year, year or two. Okay. I'd and have so to go back to the paper. When you're looking at the mechanistic data and you have one study showing that immediately after exposure to formulated Roundup or formulated glyphosate, there's genetic damage, and then that genetic damage disappears after a few years. What does that indicate to you? Well, in, in human blood, it would be expected unless there were continued exposure. If the exposure was periodic, um, human blood turns over fairly rapidly, uh, six months, give or take. Most of the cells in, in your blood system have turned over and gone away. Um, so they're they're differentiated. Unless you're looking down in the bone marrow where the, the cells begin, um, you wouldn't expect to see the, the DNA damage sitting around for a long period of time. Um, and for people who are using or being exposed to formulated glyphosate repeatedly every couple of weeks, what does that indicate based on the Pazamino study? Um, it would indicate that you'd probably see DNA damage consistently higher in those people as compared to others. And when you consistently have increased or elevated rates of genetic damage, does that increase the likelihood of developing lymphoma? That is the theory, and that is usually what would occur, but there's absolutely no guarantee. It's, it's part of the theoretical belief of how cancer arises. And you said there was another study that was done also uh, in, in humans using formulations, is that right? Correct. Uh, what was, who did that study? That study was done by Dr. Bolognese, um, and that's a different study. And what did that, how was that study different? Well, that study is, in my opinion, a stronger study. Um, in this case, in the, in the Pazimunio study, 
you're actually comparing communities. That's your, your sort of comparison group. Here, um, what Dr. Bolognese did was they knew there was going to be spraying in the area, so they went and measured people for DNA damage before spraying and then after spraying. So they had five communities, four of them near areas that were going to be sprayed, and one further away with no spraying, similar to Paz and Muno, but they did before and after measurements. And when you look at the analysis of the before and after, which is the strongest analysis, you see an increase of um, DNA damage after exposure, after the, the spraying occurred Why? in the individual. You're comparing my now against my before. It's a much stronger comparison than my community against that community. Okay, and other than these three studies that look specifically at genetic damage in humans exposed to formulation products, has there been any other studies done? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, and just looking at the in vivo human data, the three studies we just discussed, what does it tell you as a scientist? Um, it, it tells me that glyphosate formulations are, um, can induce DNA damage. In human blood? In human blood. Okay. Um, let's move on to the, the, the number two group. And I, I didn't prepare a chart for mammals, but I did look uh, prepare a chart for human in vitro studies, okay? Um, and you, have you looked at all the human in vitro studies that looked at glyphosate and formulations? Yes, I have. And, is, and have you reviewed the, the peer-reviewed articles about that? Yes, I have. Um, I also reviewed the... Uh, any of the industry uh, data that was available to me for review. Okay. I want to take a look at um, uh, our first chart here. Um, this is Exhibit 874, sir. Um, it's titled Human In Vitro Genotoxicity Data. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. And what does this chart reflect? So under the column study, is the author's name or names and the year in which the study occurred. All of these probably should have et al's on them. There's more than one author. Um, the second column reflects whether the study was done uh, using glyphosate or the third column using a formulation. So the second column would be the findings for pure glyphosate and the third column would be the findings for the formulation. Okay. And we have this key here on the right uh, a plus for positive. Well, what does this key show? Well, if we're going to do what I think we're doing, we're going to sit down and put in positive negatives. You see the NDs on there are already there. That means that in that particular study, let's take the first one, Vig Fusen and Visa uh, from 1980, they studied only the formulation. They did not study the glyphosate pure form. So there's no data on glyphosate pure in that study. Um, plus would mean it was a positive study in some way, shape, or form. Negative would mean it was a negative study completely, um, and ND means no data. Okay. And then, for example, down here with Gasnier, Gasnier, 2009, there's no ND. What does that mean? Um, that means they studied both glyphosate and the glyphosate formulation. I will point, point out, however, that's wrong. Uh, in reviewing the way we did the chart, that this chart um, last night, Gasnier actually didn't do glyphosate, so oh. there's no data on there for gl for Gasnier. So that's I'll put the an only ND. one that's wrong. Okay. It's an ND. Okay, so I picked up on the one that was wrong. Okay, Bolognese did both. <laughs> All right. Um, what about Kohler? Kohler did both um, glyphosate and glyphosate formulations. Okay, great. Sir, how are you physically doing right now? Is this a good time for a break? 11.30. Uh, we can go to 12. Okay, great. If you'd let's like. Let's keep going. Um, all right, sir, well, let's go through these studies very quickly. Um, the first study, uh, and I'll just call them the first study because I don't want to mispronounce these, these fine people's names. Okay. <laughs> um, the first study, was that positive or negative in the formulation? That was positive in the formulation. Okay. But Bolognese, 1997. Yes. Was it positive in glyphosate? Um, it was positive in glyphosate and positive in the formulation. Leoli, 1998, in glyphosate, what was the results? 
Leoy, 1998, and it was positive. Okay, great. The next one, 2004. Um, Lucan did two different types of human cells. The previous ones did lymphocytes, but Lucan is looking at specifically cultured cells. He did two types of cultured cells, and it's a, it's a different study. I, I want to be fair here. They studied glyphosate with hydrogen peroxide. Now, hydrogen peroxide causes DNA damage. Mm. And what they were looking at was whether glyphosate, when you add it to hydrogen peroxide, makes it worse. Gotcha. And it did. So when we say a positive here, it means that glyphosate, when added to hydrogen peroxide, made the DNA damage from hydrogen peroxide even worse. Gotcha. Okay? So it was positive for both cell lines that they looked at. And there was two in there. There were two. Uh, and you said these first three, they were all lymphocytes? They were all lymphocytes. Human lymphocytic cells? Human lymphocytes from donors. All right, I'm going to put an L next to those three. And if any of these other ones are lymphocytes, you let me know, okay? Okay. Uh, the next one, Monroy, 2005. Again, looking at two cell lines that are not lymphocytes, specific cultured cell lines, and both were positive. Uh, gas in there, we, there was no data for glyphosate, but for the formulation, what were the results? They, they claimed it was positive, but I, I have concerns about the study. I would call it inadequate. So even though they said it was positive, you're saying you're not sure? I'm saying it's inadequate. I'm, I'm saying it's, it's the way they did it, the, the limitations to the assay they used are such that, um, and the way they pre pre presented their results, or, or difficult to, to interpret appropriately, I think it's an inadequate study. All right, so I'm gonna put a question mark on it. Is that okay? That's perfect. And then um, just because the authors, they concluded it was positive, I'll put that on there in parentheses, okay? Okay. Um, and then Manas, 2009. They did two different types of cells, one of which was lymphocytes, okay. and the other was a, a liver cancer cell line. Uh, the liver cancer cell line was positive, the lymphocytes were negative. So we have a negative and a positive. Correct. Okay. What about Maldinic? I said that wrong. Maldinic? I have no idea. Maldinic. Um, that was lymphocytes, it was positive. Okay, now there's two here. Are these, is this, is this a, a yeah, error or? No, it's two separate publications, two separate sets of lymphocytes and two different ways of evaluating DNA damage. Um, so the second publication was also lymphocytes and it's also positive. Okay. Kohler, 2012. Uh, that's a cell line, it's not lymphocytes. Uh, both were positive, positive for glyphosate and positive for the um, um, formulation. Well, Alvarez Moya, 2004. That was, that was lymphocytes, and that was positive. All right, sir. And I understand the, these were the studies that go through 2014. Is that right? That is correct. Have there been studies done since then that you've reviewed? Um, yes, there have been studies since then. All right. Let's look at exhibit uh, 876. This is titled Recent In Vitro Human Genotoxicity Data. Do you see that, sir? Yes, I see that. All right, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to go through these studies, and we're going to see which ones were positive, negative, or I guess, at least with one of these studies, uninterpretable, okay? To be fair, these are 2017, 2018, and 2019 is where I looked. I, I, I don't know if there are 2015, 16 in studies that I've missed. So to be, be fair, if these are the most recent last two years. Fair enough. Um, so let's go through this. Uh, Townsend, 2017. This was on glyphosate. What was the results of that? Well, that was positive. And uh, again, let me know if any of these are human lymphocytes, okay? Okay. Uh, Luo. Oh, by the way, just to go back, is this Bolognese study from 1997, is that a different study than the in vivo study we talked about earlier? Uh, I think they're connected. Okay. So we have uh, Luo 2017 uh, in the formulated product. What were the results of that one? Uh, that was positive. But I will note that, um, um, in my opinion, it's, it's 
positive with a little bit of a question mark. Okay. So I'm going to do a little question mark. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's not as strong as some of the others. I, 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 I would, if that was the only one I have, I, I would hesitate to use it. Okay. Uh, the next one from 2017. This is leukocytes, not lymphocytes. So it's a, but it's it's drawn from human blood. Okay. Um, so I'll put blood on here. And that one was positive. Okay. Uh, the next one from 2017, Kasuba. Uh, this one's positive, and the note, the most notable thing about this one was it was positive at at fairly low exposures. Okay. Why is that important? They made a they made a a, 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 um, a point of choosing exposures that they believed were at the levels that regulatory authorities were setting the exposures, um, setting the regulatory limits, and they made a big point of being very careful to match those exposures in doing their DNA damage studies. And why is that relevant to your analysis? Um, uh, it's not really. It's it's relevant to the question of what happens at low, very low exposures, um, uh, which is to some degree important in an evaluation of hazard. But in this case, I'm being asked, is it possible that it can cause cancer? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, and I think the epidemiology studies speak very strongly to the question of can it occur in humans at the levels that we're currently exposed to. So I don't necessarily need this, but it is something to note from the study because it was important to them to note in doing their study. Okay. This next one, uh, Wozniak, 2018. That's again human leukocytes, so blood. Okay. Um, and it was positive for both the formulation and for glyphosate. All right. Uh, the next one from 2018. Santa Vito, that was lymphocytes. Um, that one was positive as well. Okay, uh, 2018, the next one. D. Almeida. Um, they did three human cell lines. Oh, wow. Um, a, uh, b two breast cancer cell lines and one um, endometrial cell line. That's, that's the layer of cells that's sort of way below the basal part of the skin and in other places in the body. Um, it was negative for one of the breast cancer cell lines for glyphosate and positive for the other two, and it was negative for the same cell lines in the formulation and positive for the other two. So it's negative plus plus in both cases. Okay, great. Um, then we have this next one from 2018. This was human sperm, um, and it was negative. Okay. All right, sir. So we're looking at these genotoxicity data that uh, it's in the peer-reviewed literature, and um, on the first chart here, um, it's almost across the board positive. Again, in the second chart, it's almost across the board positive. What significance does that have to you? Well, it, it's simply repeating the same thing over and over again that um, glyphosate actually can um, cause DNA damage in cells and so can the formulation. And I want to be very clear. We, we listed all these different studies where there was lymphocytes involved. Do you see that? Yes. Um, in your professional opinion and expert opinion, do you believe that glyphosate is genotoxic in human lymphocytes? Yes. Uh, do you believe the formulation is genotoxic to human lymphocytes? Yes. Santa Vito is lumen, human lymphocytes. Let's move on to the next mechanism of, of, of carcinogenesis. Well, actually, no, let's... Let's actually stay with genotoxicity for a second. I want to go back to that picture we had up earlier. Um, and we were looking at uh, these different types of genetic damage, and we spent some time talking about micronuclei. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, just before the break, we were uh, going back to this genotoxicity diagram, exhibit 886. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about micronucleus, okay? Okay. Um, has there been a... Uh, and before we get going, sir, how are you physically feeling? I want to make sure we're not wearing you out. All right. We're fine to continue. Just before the break, we were talking about genotoxicity, and we were looking at this exhibit, 886. I want to talk specifically about micronuclei, okay? Okay. Um, 
Has there been a meta-analysis specifically done on micronuclei studies with glyphosate and formulated Roundup? Yes, there has. Okay. And is that a study that you reviewed in rendering your opinions in this case? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, why don't you turn to Exhibit uh, 560 in your binder? Okay. Is this that meta-analysis that you were referring to? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So we have it up here on the screen. Uh, this uh, document, it's titled, Does Exposure to Glyphosate Lead to an Increase in the, mu in the Micronuclei Frequency? A Systematic and Meta-Analytic meta Review. What is, it, what is this study about, sir? Um, this study takes all of the peer-reviewed um, um, micronucleus assays and the um, industry micronucleus assays that are available and puts them into one global analysis to see to what degree there is positive um, findings for micronucleus. And the jury may have heard about this from Dr. Ritz, but what is your understanding of a meta-analysis? In a meta-analysis, you're taking results from multiple studies using the, 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 the observed response and the noise around the observed response to bring them all together appropriately um, to, to look for a global observed response. So if we dig into the study, uh, if you go to the fifth page in the study, um, there's a chart. It's labeled um, Table 1. It's also on the screen, so if you want to just follow yes. along. Okay, and, and this lists a bunch of different studies. Do you see that? Yes, I do see it. What are these studies referring to? They are each individual dose groups in individual studies of uh, micronucleus in exposure to, after exposure to either glyphosate or glyphosate formulations. And if we look on here, for example, uh, here's a study that I think you might recognize, Bolognese, uh, 1997. Do you see that? Yes, I oh. see it. Okay, great. And so if we, uh, we go down here, on the, on the, starting on the seventh page, there is this plot. And I've, I've blown it up here for the jury. Um, what kind of chart, what would you call this chart? Um, this this would be in in, the, in parlance of statistics, a forest plot. And if you actually look at the bottom, is that what they call it? Yes. Okay. And um, walk the jury through how you read a chart like this. What are we seeing here? Okay. So let's look at the y the x axis first, which is the one across the bottom. Um, that is the, in log scale. Um, log is just a way of switching numbers around to, to sort of bring wide numbers into smaller numbers for the audience. It's, it's a simple mathematical tool. Um, the line in, that's going straight up in the middle of that is at zero. That is the point in this type of a plot where there is no effect. So any studies that lined up with that zero are showing no effect. Studies to the left of that zero are showing a reduction in micronucleus from exposure to either glyphosate or glyphosate formulations. Studies to the right that, that have their that bulk to the right of zero in that plot are showing a increase in micronuclei from exposure to glyphosate or glyphosate formulation depending on the study. And um, the jury will have heard a little bit about epidemiology and maybe even seeing some of these sorts of charts with epidemiology. Um, in an epidemiology force plot, is the no effect at zero or one? Uh, it's, it's always at one, but when you take the log of one, the log of one is zero, which is why this one's at zero, because they've got log on the um, horizontal axis. Okay. And so if we look in here, um, 
it actually has these numbers next to each line. Do you see that? That, yes, I do see them. What, is, what does that number refer to, for example, 93? That number corresponds to table one, where we just looked, and it corresponds to the 93rd study listed in table one. Okay. And then if you see buried in here, it's kind of hard to see, there's something called the grand mean. Do you see that? Yes. What is that? So this uh, forest plots are used to do... Um, uh, um, meta-analysis, and when you do a meta-analysis, as I mentioned earlier, you're bringing all that information to, to get one answer. This is the overall meta-analysis for all of these studies. It is um, what do all of these data tell me, regardless of whether they're in fish or frogs or humans or dogs or cats or mice or rats, what does all of this tell us as one bulk of data? That's what the grand mean is. And if we look here on the chart, uh, the grand mean is right there. Is that right? That's correct. And what significance of any is there to the fact that the grand mean is that far to the right of the line? Um, it means that it's, it, it's in, on average, the, um, the risk posed by glyphosate or glyphosate formulations in this entire class of body of evidence is positive. And the fact that the little lines that are stemming from the side, it looks like just a little plus mark for the grand mean, but that's yeah. actually the 95% confidence around the point. The fact that the bottom of that line does not cross over zero means that it's statistically significantly different from no, no effect. And that's kind of what we were talking about earlier with p-values, is that right? Correct. Okay. And now if we turn to the next page, um, there's some other, there's some additional charts here. Um, I want to sort of raise, uh, kind of ask you to explain what they refer to. Let's look at chart A, right? So here we have um, chart A, and you can see the grand mean is on here. Do you see that? Yes, I do. All right. And what do these other things refer to? Um, so chart A is the same type of chart. Um, uh, so zero, which is all the way to the left, is the no effect level. Um, and you're looking at different classes of animals. So you've got fish, you've got amphibians, you've got crocodiles, um, which are reptiles, and then you've got mice, and they're showing the, the meta-analysis results just for those subclasses, again, for glyphosate and glyphosate formulations. Most of the fish studies are glyphosate formulations, although there are some laboratories. The amphibians and the crocodiles, they're all glyphosate formulations. The mice are a mixture. And we spent quite a bit of time earlier today talking about the importance of mice studies. Is that significant to you that the mice study is is all the way to the right? Well, th there, <coughs> I mean, it's, it's significant that they're mammals and they're, they are mice. Um, some of these studies, not all of them, but some of them are regulatory studies because uh, the micronucleus assay in mice is a good general assay for DNA damage, uh, regardless of the type of damage. So you're not looking for single strand breaks or double strand breaks you're looking at general area of DNA damage. Um, and so regulatory agencies require it. They ask people to do it. So there are a number of studies in here that were submitted by the regulators. So that's what makes it important is that um, it's one of the key studies that regulatory agencies use to decide on the safety of a compound. All right. Um, and then, for example, on the next one, uh, chart B, there is a a dist uh, distinction between, um, well, what is the distinction between? Uh, here it's the between mammals and non-mammals. So your fish and your crocodiles and your um, hairy armadillas are all to the left in the non-mammalian group, and the mammalian group is up there. And what you're seeing again is zero, no effect, is way to the left, showing that these are all uh, increased in their uh, risk when you bring them together in a meta-analysis. And the fact that we have here uh, a much larger distance to the right 
for mammals than non-mammals, does that have any significance to you in assessing you know, the genotoxicity of, of Roundup in humans? It, it just says the mammals are, um, um, the, the information is stronger that there's a DNA damage in the mammals. Okay. Um, and then if we see down here, and I, we don't have to spend too much time on this, but I do want to just show you, we have, for example, uh, another chart, and here they've broken it down. Well, how have they broken it down on this one? Okay, so these are uh, different types of ways to expose, to be exposed to um, glyphosate or glyphosate formulations. Uh, oral is either by feed or uh, it, it's by, by feed, you eat it. Immersion is for fish, you, you're swimming in it. Um, spraying is for people and some of the ecological uh, studies that were done in animals that are in the fields that are sprayed. Uh, topical is on the skin. Uh, intraperitoneal is injecting it into the peritoneum, which is the lower part of the cavity of these animals, the gut area, gut, stomach, liver. And it looks like the, 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 the chart B here is breaking it down by uh, males and females. Do you see that? Correct. And um, we have... Uh, we have, for example, females that the line actually crosses the line. Do you see that? Correct. They have an increased risk in the meta-analysis, but it's not statistically significant, whereas the males are statistically significant. Yeah, and if you look at the male one, it's way over here on the right. Do you see that? Yeah, that may reflect more the fact that there are a lot of male studies and not a lot of female studies. And then what is this, uh, this part in the middle, this both, what does that refer to? Uh, that's just the c combination of the male and female data at the same time. Okay. And was that statistically ignoring, significant? Ignoring gender. Okay. Was that statistically significant? That one is statistically significant. All right. Um, and and this, this process of looking at all these studies in different ways, is, is that commonly done in meta-analysis? Um, uh, it should be done here. There, there's definitely... In, most meta-analyses are done with epidemiology data and they will break it down into important characteristics. You, you have different, excuse me, different types of studies or studies from uh, different continents or different countries, and so you would break it down and look at the individual continents or the individual countries. It's a sensitivity analysis. You're looking at how sensitive the findings are to subclassing the information. Chart A, what does this reflect? This is the forest plot looking at um, glyphosate technical versus, um, they call it Roundup, but it's actually uh, glyphosate formulations. It could be any formulation. From my reading of this document, it's not just Roundup. Um, and comparing the, the grand means for the two subclasses. And what, if any, significance is there to the fact that Roundup is, is significantly farther to the right than just glyphosate? It would suggest that the evidence for Roundup is stronger, that there is uh, an increase in micronucleus in these data for glyphosate formulations. Now, earlier you were talking about uh, regulatory studies and non-regulatory studies. Do you recall that? Yes. What does this chart reflect? Um, for the most part, it reflects the regulatory studies versus the literature studies. So peer-reviewed means those are studies that have appeared in the peer-reviewed literature. The non-peer-reviewed are the studies that they were able to get that were regulatory submission studies. And again, they're both significantly um, different than no effect. And um, uh, is there any significance to the fact that the peer-reviewed data is significantly farther to the right than the non-peer-reviewed data? Uh, again, it's the same thing. The peer-reviewed data has um, a stronger indication that glyphosate can cause micronucleus in these data. Let's take a quick step back, sir. I mean, have you ever been an editor on a journal? Oh, yes, I have. Um, are you familiar with what peer review is? Yes, of course. What is peer review? Peer review is um, when, you, when you wish to have a paper put out in the scientific literature for other con others to consider, um, Journals like to make sure that the paper is, appears to be scientifically sound and based on sound strategies, sound arguments, and it's complete. It, it's provided everything you need to do to understand what's done. Um, so they will take that paper and send it to several people who are knowledgeable about 
that area of research who will read it and comment on the quality and the um, um, the arguments used by the, the, the scientists involved and whether they made their case or didn't make their case, what are the limitations. Sometimes they will uh, reject the paper outright and say this is just the, the garbage, you can't understand it, we don't know what it means. Um, sometimes they love it and they go, we'll take it, it's perfect, you should publish it like that. Most times there's going to be, um, you, you, we'd like to see this figure, uh, we don't think that one's very informative, you should just remove it. Did you do this analysis? If you did, could you show it? Because we'd like to see what the results of that was. So there are some suggestions for changes. If the changes are made, then it's usually published. And all things being equal, sir, uh, you prefer, well, well, all things being equal, are peer-reviewed articles more reliable than non-peer-reviewed articles? As a general statement, that would be correct. In the case of regulatory studies, um, as compared to, to peer-reviewed studies, I, I would argue that they're probably of equal quality. Um, there are requirements that go into developing things under peer review, under um, regulatory guidelines that require a stringency um, that, that anybody peer-reviewing it who read the notes that said, we did this under these guidelines, would probably accept it as a clean, reasonable study. They may not agree to the conclusions, they may not agree to the method of analysis or the analyses in a peer review, but at least they can agree to the quality of the study. Um, so in a general rule, peer review is better than non-peer review, but in a regulatory context, um, I would have to look carefully at the non-peer reviewed before I'd say, well, no, it's, it's worse. I, I don't think as a general rule I would I would approach it as saying it's worse simply because it's not peer reviewed. This uh, meta-analysis by uh, Dr. Giese and her colleagues, um, is, is this something that you relied on? I did. Um, it's got its limitations, but certainly I, it was part of the evidence I looked at uh, in coming to my decision. And what decision did you come to with respect to whether or not Roundup or glyphosate can cause micronuclei in cells? Um, in mammalian systems, uh, which is the important one for me, um, I believe micro, uh, uh, glyphosate can cause micronucleus in mammalian systems. And the creation of micronuclei, is that a, a, a recognized mechanism through which something can cause cancer? Yes. All right. Uh, so we've been talking about genotoxicity uh, for a little bit now. I, I want to move on to the second one. What was, what was the second one, sir? The, the second mechanism that was considered that where they had enough evidence was oxidative stress. And you, you discussed what it was earlier, but let's just refresh everyone's recollection. What exactly is oxidative stress uh, in, in, a, in a human cell? Um, I'm going to try to make it as non-complicated as I possibly can. Um, uh, oxidative stress, so oxygen is the energy source of cells. I, I mean, it drives a lot of what we do in the cells. Um, to keep ourselves alive and moving and functioning and everything else. It's the energy source. Um, oxygen radicals are oxygen molecules that, have, that are not bound to anything. You know, water is H2O. So you've got two molecules of hydrogen bound to an oxygen. Um, and that's a very stable chemical. But when you pull those hydrogens off, that oxygen becomes very reactive and it wants to bind to anything else. So if there's any oxygen around, hydrogen around, it's going to bind to the hydrogen and reform water. Okay, so in cells, that oxygen that's not bound to anything gets bound, then it gets unbound, then it gets bound again, and that's doing the work of the cell. It's binding and unbinding energy sources. Oxygen is one of them. Um, there are things that receive that oxygen in the cell, and so you've got to balance. You don't want too many things there that are not bound to to um, oxygen because they can cause a problem and you don't want too much oxygen that's, that's not binding because that can cause a problem. So you've got to balance. Oxidative stress is when you go out of balance. Either you remove the things that the oxygen is binding to, reduce them, which causes more free oxygen around, or you make more free oxygen um, than can bind to what's there and then more free oxygen is around. That free oxygen 
can bind to micronuclei, to um, mitochondria, it can bind to DNA, it can bind to other structures in the cell that can begin to damage the cell, and that damage to the cell can lead to mutations or other problems that can lead to cancer. But sir, I mean, you're talking about oxygen in a cell. I mean, isn't there oxygen in our cells every day? Absolutely. So you, you when, why are I getting cancer? cancer? Um, because too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. Um, uh, it, you want to keep the balance. You, you want to make sure that you're not going uh, overboard on the amount of free oxygen in the cell. So when we talk about oxidative stress in the context of glyphosate, are we talking about something that causes a, an, an imbalance? Um, that, that would be the, the root source of the oxidative stress, some sort of imbalance. All right. Um, so just like with genotoxicity, uh, there's our in vivo studies and in vitro studies. Is that right? Correct. Um, have there been any in vivo human studies, like living people, that looked at oxidative stress with ground up or glyphosate? No. Okay. So that you know that so we had that tier um, for genotoxicity. The number one, the humans in vivo, we don't have that for oxidative stress. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. What about number two, humans in uh, human cells in vitro? Do we have any data about that? Yes. Um, did you actually help us prepare a chart similar to the genotoxicity for oxidative stress? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, so this is exhibit 877, and it's titled Human in Vitro Oxidative Stress. Uh, what does this chart reflect, sir? Um, Similar to the previous chart, the first column gives studies. Each individual study is a peer-reviewed study of uh, oxidative stress in cells, um, in human cells. Uh, the next column, labeled glyphosate, is studies that is, is going to be a positive, negative, or no data for technical glyphosate, pure glyphosate. And the last column, formulation, is for some glyphosate formulation. Okay. And I noticed some of these names are familiar from, from the previous chart. So, for example, Wozniak, do you see that? <laughs> yes. Um, is, uh, how, how, was there, how are they on this chart and, in, and on the previous chart? Uh, it's the same study. Many times when you do a study on oxidative stress, you're also going to do a study on um, DNA damage because the two are related, because the oxygen radicals can bind to DNA, they can damage DNA strand breaks um, that you can then see. And so the two are related to each other, and it's not uncommon to see both in the same paper. Now, I want to be clear. We're here talking about human data, right? Correct. Um, have there been studies done on bacteria or mammals or reptiles? Oh, yes. There's, there's studies in animals. There's studies in crocodiles, there's studies in all kinds of uh, different animals and then in various and sundry other cell lines. So why then are we focusing on human cells here? Again, it's because, uh, well, if, if we're setting my priorities, again, my priorities are always, for, for oxidative stress, it's, it, this is real tough because um, the human cells, again, those are cells from humans, so they're close to the target I'm interested in. Um, but they're not in functioning organisms, and the rodent models for functioning organisms might be better here for oxidative stress because uh, they're in functioning organisms. And oxidative stress, DNA damage is a single target. Oxidative stress is a target of an entire system. And so it might be that that's better, but they're, again, somewhat equal. So we're looking at human here because it's human cells. All right. So let's go through this again. Uh, we have our positive and negatives uh, in here. Before I get started, are any of these no datas incorrect? No. Okay. We got this one correct. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so let's go with the first one, starting in 2005. Uh, well, did this look at both glyphosate and formulation? Uh, yes, they did. And um, uh, they were both positive in a very unique way, a unique type assay. But yes, they were both positive. Can you explain why it was unique? Yes. Um, instead of looking directly for oxidative stress, what they did was looked at reduction in um, cell death 
using antioxidants. And by showing that the antioxidants reduced toxicity in the cell, they're showing that there's too much free oxygen in the cell. And so their argument was that they're seeing um, oxidative stress because they can relieve it with the antioxidant. Uh, antioxidants, I mean, I, I hear about that all the time. What are those? Um, they're, they're chemicals or, or things that enter into the cell that bind out the free oxygen, let's put it that way, in a safe way. And so the, do they help reduce oxidative stress? Yes, they do. Okay. All right. The next one from 2009, uh, that was on glyphosate. Yes. Do you still want to know if it's in lymphocytes or not? Oh, yes, please. So that one is in lymphocytes. Okay. Um, and that was positive. Not, no, not the mladenic oh. is in lymphocytes. The first one is not. And that okay. one is positive. Okay, great. Um, what about the 2010 one? Um, okay, they, they called it positive, um, but I don't like the, the, the assay they used, plus their doses were extremely high to the point of potentially suffocating the cells. Uh, I call this one inadequate. Okay, so just like we did last time, I'll put a question mark. Does that work? That's fine. And, and then I'll this put... one's clearly inadequate. I'm not even going to come right. be wishy-washy on it. All this right. one's clearly inadequate. I, I would never include this in my decisions. Okay. So how do you want me to mark it so it's clearly reflecting? Question mark's fine. Okay. I won't even put the plus, though. Yeah, I wouldn't put the plus. Okay. Sounds good. All right. George and Shukla, uh, 2013. The, this one's... They were positive. They... they, they saw it as positive. I, I agree that with what they did, they saw it as positive, but I'm, I'm a little iffy on this one too. They used the same assay as the one by Ely Kayo, um, um, but what they, they used much lower exposures, so the cytotoxicity is not such a big deal. So I'm in between this one saying, yeah, it's positive or it's inadequate. So I'd put a question mark next to that too. Does that work? Yep, that would work. Okay, and before we move on, you said a word, cytotoxicity. What does that mean? Oh, the, the, they were putting, in the Ely Kale study, they were putting so much glyphosate into the Petri dish with the cells that it was affecting the ability of the cells to survive. Um, you know, the cells need a, a nutritious buffer in which to live. They don't live in water. You've got to put in nutrients and all kinds of stuff. And when you add a chemical to it, uh, it can block the access to those nutrients and cells start to die. They had so much chemical in there. I, I just can't imagine that the effects we're looking at are due to glyphosate. They're due to the fact that you've got a huge amount of chemical in there. Okay. And so what you mean by cytotoxicity is cell if death. If you put in any chemical, you'd have the same problem. Correct. But it's in, in cytotoxicity technically means cell death. And so when you see increased cytotoxicity, that's okay with an oxidative stress study because oxidative stress can result from cytotoxicity and that's important. And cytotoxicity can result from oxidative stress. That's important. But when you put in so much chemical that it, you're, you're killing it by something other than slight changes in oxidative stress, the cytotoxicity is too high. Gotcha. All right, this one from 2014. Um, uh, it's negative for glyphosate and positive for the formulation. Um, what significance of any do you see from that? Now, this is an interesting study for that question because the negative for um, the glyphosate itself was at a fairly high dose, whereas the positive for the formulation was at a much lower equivalent exposure. So this particular study would suggest that the formulation in these cells, in this case, is much more effective at causing DNA damage than is the um, glyphosate pure itself. All right, let's go for the next one, uh, 2014. Kolova. Um, that one was positive. All right, what about the next one from 2014? Um, that was in red blood cells in humans, okay. um, and that one is positive. Um, what about Luo from 2017? Um, yeah, that one was positive. 
that one was clearly positive. All right, uh, Katsuba, 2017. Uh, that one was positive. And then uh, to the last one from 2018. Um, that's human leukocytes, and both of those are positive. And by leukocytes, does that mean blood? A type of, of one of the sub blood cells, yes. I think that's what we were doing before we called it blood, so yeah. I'll keep doing that here. They were both positive? Yes. All right. Um, well, sir, I mean, again, we're looking at this chart now for oxidative stress in, in humans. Um, what does this data indicate to you? Um, that both glyphosate and the formulation can induce oxidative stress in human cells. And um, we, we came to a similar sort of resolution for genotoxicity. Is your opinion regarding oxidative stress as strong? Yes. When I look at not just this, but the in vivo data from animals and other things, there, there's no doubt that the oxidative stress data is strong and it's, it's quite clear. All right. Um, I'll go back to the stool that we, we were sort of using as a road map here. Um, and so far we've talked about animal studies and we've talked about mechanistic studies. Is that right? Correct. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want to get a sense of your, st your opinion about the strength of this evidence so far. For the animal studies, do you think it's strong or how would you characterize it? Um, I would characterize it as saying um, glyphosate can cause cancer in mammals. And then for the mechanism studies, what, what, what's, what's the conclusion there? Um, glyphosate can induce DNA damage in uh, mammalian cells and in human cells. Um, and it can induce oxidative stress in mammalian systems and in human cells. And when you reach that opinion about these two sort of groups of studies, is that opinion reached to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Oh, yes. There's, there's very little uncertainty. Okay. All right. Um, I want to go to this last prong, epidemiology. And, and I'll, I'll let you know, doctor, that Dr. Ritz is, will have already testified by the time the jury hears your testimony. So. I don't want to spend too much time covering the basics, okay? Okay. Uh, have you reviewed the epidemiology in this case? Oh, yes. Okay. I have. And uh, what did that review consist of? Um, reading all the epidemiological studies that relate to um, glyphosate and any disease, but most, mostly focused on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, reading the ancillary studies, because when you do an epi study, you don't just publish one paper. You pu pu publish papers on how you measure dose and all kinds of other things. And so you have to read those as well, um, and so reading them as well. Okay. And the process through which you reviewed the epidemiology, the animal studies, the mechanism studies, is that the process that you used when you worked at the National Toxicology Program or the National Institute of Health? Yes, the National Toxicology Program has the report on carcinogens, which is the U.S. government's official report on what chemicals, well, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services official list of what chemicals cause cancer in humans, and we used the same, they used the same approach. And did you help, like, figure out what substances should go on that list and when you worked? I was responsible for... Um, making the final re um, recommendation to the director who signed off on what should go on that list. He usually just signed the list. So um, I, I don't want to spend too much time going through the epidemiology, but I want to talk about a few, few things. I understand that you've, you've placed all of the studies onto a chart. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. All of the not, well, I, Depends which chart you're going to bring up. There are several charts that I've made, um, some of which has, have all of the studies. It, well, no one chart has all of the results from all of the studies um, because there are just too many results. So there are different charts. It depends which chart you want to bring up. All right, well, let's focus on meta-analysis, okay? Okay. Um, please turn to exhibit 787 in your binder. 787? Seven, that is incorrect. Set, uh, eight, I'm sorry. It would be uh, exhibit 
878. 878. That's right. Okay. Is that a copy of the chart you prepared with the uh, meta-analysis? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. So uh, I'm going to put this up on the screen. Um, before we get started, uh, where did you derive this chart from? Oh, uh, a recent meta-analysis that was done on all of the epidemiology data by Zhang and co-workers. Um, published uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this is from directly from Table Seven. This is a different way of looking at their Table Seven. Okay, great. Um, so let's let's break this down a little bit. So we have on the right here, we have this blue line. Do you see that? Yes. What does that blue line indicate? So, like the forest plot we saw just a minute ago for the um, uh, micronucleus assays. This is one. This is where there's no effect in the data. So if something is to the right of one, what does that mean? If the, the so you have little black, squ little squares and lines extending from the little squares. Here, I'll, I'll call one out. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good example right there. That black square in the middle, and then you've got lines extending from two sides. Um, the black square is the mean of the relative risk, the risk ratio. So if that mean is directly on the blue line, then its value is 1. And that says uh, there's no effect. If it's to the left, its value is below 1. That says there is an effect. It's a reduction of risk. If it's to the right, it says there is an effect, there's an increase in risk. The little spindly lines coming out of it are a 95% confidence bound. Um, if the bottom end of that line touches the blue line, then it's not statistically significant, but it's increased. Um, if it doesn't touch it, it is statistically significant at the 5% level. So looking at these two right here, that the top one has a point to the right of the blue line, but its whiskers don't touch the blue line. What does that mean? You're talking about the black square. Yeah, the one right up here on the screen. Uh, um, that top black square is significantly increased um, uh, risk from exposure to a glyphosate, glyphosate formulations in that study. Okay, great. What does the second black square with these whiskers indicate? It shows an increase in the risk from exposure to glyphosate formulations in that study, but it's not statistically significant. Okay. And so when we look at all these, these points and whiskers on this chart, what do these all reflect? Well, they reflect different things because they're, they're pulling from different pieces of each of these epi studies. Um, I, I'm sure the jury has by now seen Dr. Ritz talk about the fact that these epi studies um, have different ways of looking at exposure. So they might look at were they exposed or not exposed. They might look at were they exposed for 10 years or not exposed, or exposed for less than 10 years. Were they exposed for two days or less than two days. Their way they're going to, the epi studies will break it down. And so one epi study might have 10 or 12 different evaluations in it. Um, in this tape, Table 7, <clears throat> Zhang et al. were pulling out the pieces of these studies that were used in various meta-analyses. So these are parts of the individual epi studies that are being displayed here. Okay, um, so uh, the top part, uh, we have different colors. So the first, th first three lines are red. Do you see that, Doctor? Yes, I uh, see what, that. What do those refer to? Okay, the, the first three lines come from two different publications. Um, let, let me walk you through the columns real quick. Okay. The column that says study is the name of the author and the year in which that particular epidemiology study was done. Okay. The column that says or or, that is the relative risk, that's the mean value of the relative risk um, for that study. I'll stop um, right there. And when we talk about relative risks or odds ratios, what does anything above one mean? 
Th that above one means there's a positive association between the exposure and the disease, in this case, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Below one means there's a negative association, um, which means that the people who were exposed had less non-Hodgkin's lymphoma than the unexposed. And when it's exactly one, it means there's no difference. Okay. So then we have lower and upper. What do those refer to? So that's the 95% confidence bound. The lower is the lower part of that confidence bound. The upper is the upper part of the confidence bound. For all practical purposes, the simple way to look at it is if the lower bound is below one, that means it's not statistically significantly increased. If the upper bound is above one, that means it's not statistically significantly decreased. Um, gotcha. And so you can draw those inferences from looking at the confidence bounds. And uh, would it be fair to say then that the lower and upper refer to the left and right side of the whiskers? Uh, yes, that's exactly what they, in fact, when you look at the plot, the, you can see that with the first one, Andriotti et al. 2018, the lower bound is 0.83, which is less than one. And if you could, if I had put 0.83 on the x-axis, the bottom of it would match exactly with 0.83 at the bottom. Okay, great. And then, um, so then for the for the first two colors, you have the studies, the r risk ratios, the lower and upper confidence bounds, and at the very bottom there's green ones. You see that? Correct. And then it has letters to the right of it under included. So. Can I answer your other question first as to, I didn't answer, what would the red mean? Okay, fair I, enough. I, I, I told you what each time. column meant, but <laughs> I didn't tell you what the red meant. Fair enough. What is the red stuff? Referred? So these are two separate publications in 2018 and 2015 from one study. Um, it's called the Agricultural Health Study. It's a cohort study. So they are following people over time who work in the agricultural industry, and every once in a while, they look to see how many of them have a disease, in this case, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but they look at all disease. But for NHL, they look to see how many people have it. And because they've asked these people questions about their exposure, um, they already know whether they've been exposed or not, and so they can relate the exposure to the um, study. So the first three lines, first three rows, are all from those cohort studies. The, the Roos, 2005 um, has two columns, B and C, or the B and C columns. The first one relates to whether they were exposed or not exposed, which is used in some of the um, meta-analyses. The second relates to a grouping they did in the study of low, medium, high exposure by grouping people into those exposures. And in one of the meta-analyses, they only used the highest exposure group. So this is the result for that highest exposed group, which showed a relative risk below one. Okay. And then um, we have Darus again underneath that. Do you see that? Correct. Um, and this is, clarify, this is the same Darus that joined you in that letter we spoke about at the beginning of your testimony. Oh, that is correct. And here we have Darus 2003, and it's in a different color. Why is that? Um, so from studies D through M, they're all in the same color. It's supposed to be dark blue, but it looks like black on my copy. Um, but these are a different type of studies. These are case control studies. So in case control studies, what you've got is people with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, those are your cases. And you have controls, which are people who don't have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma but they sort of match the cases with the controls. And then you ask them about their past exposures. And what you're really looking for is, are the cases more likely to be exposed to glyphosate formulations than the controls? And so the relative risk you're looking at here is the risk of being exposed to glyphosate. Um, and each of these, with a name and a number behind it, is a single finding from that study. And then if there are multiple findings, like for Erickson, which is F, G and H are two other findings that are different, that are used in different meta-analyses. So I extracted them from that paper as well.
And so just so we can understand this, uh, if we look at line L, which is from the McDuffie study, do you see that? Yes, I see it. And it has a risk ratio of 2.12. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And the lower bound is 1.2, and the higher bound is 3.37. Do you see that? 3.73. Yes, I see that. Sorry, I sometimes mix up numbers. I appreciate that. Um, what, uh, what does that indicate? Well, that indicates in this study that people in this study who had um, more than two days per year exposure, the cases were more likely to have that more than two days per year exposure than the controls. They were twice as likely as the controls to have that level of exposure. And it was statistically significantly different from one. So then uh, the very bottom we have the green. Do you see that? Yes, I see the greens. All right. What, what does the green refer to? And specifically, what do these letters to the right of them refer to? So there are three published meta-analyses. Uh, remember, we just looked at a meta-analysis for micronuclei. This is the same thing, but now you're doing epidemiology studies and bringing them together. I'm sorry, doctor. You said there's three? Four. Oh, okay. Sorry. Four published meta-analyses. These are the results from the four published meta-analyses that were mentioned in Table 7 by Zhang. The first three are for um, were you exposed ever or never? Um, the Zhang paper looked at not ever, never, but they were interested in the highest exposed groups. So they're looking at a slightly different uh, question. But that's what all of these are. The extra numbers, the letters, the B, D, F, I, K, M for Shanasi and Leon, that refers to which of the rows from the studies went into that meta-analysis. So I'm trying to give you a feel for which studies went into which numbers that you're looking at here. Okay. Um, so um, if we actually look at the data here uh, on the, the points and the, and the whiskers, um, do you have an opinion about what this data shows? Well, as I pointed out in the expert report, not for this graph, but for the graph that I had in there, which is similar to this, um, most of the response is to the right of the value of one. That suggests that generally the trend is toward an association in these data. Um, some of them are sig significantly positive, some are not. Um, but the general trend is definitely toward a positive association. Um, if you look at ever, never, which is some of the ones in this plot, but, but um, not all of these pictures, they are all either one or above, uh, which is a very rare finding in looking at these types of epi studies. OK. Um, why don't we look at your never, ever analysis? I believe it's actually an exhibit here. Um, if you go into your. Um, in your binder, sorry, in your, um, yeah, in your binder, not eight, nine, three. Oh, yes. Is that your never ever analysis? Uh, that's the plot from the, um, well, no, it's a modified version of the plot from the, um, um, expert report, but because it's got Andriotti in it. But um, yeah, that's never, ever, that's the data. OK, I'm going to push that up on the screen. So we're looking here at uh, another plot summary. This is just the never, ever data. Is that right? Correct. This is simply from the epi studies, the comparisons of uh, were you exposed or not exposed and looking at the relative risks. Now, doctor, let's assume for a second that there actually is no relationship between Roundup exposure and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, OK? OK. So that, let's assume that's the actual truth for a second. What is the likelihood that you would see data that looks like this? So there's a way to address that question. Um, it's one of the oldest statistical tests that exist. Um, so if truth is there's no effect whatsoever, then let's think of a coin. Um, coins, if it's fair, half the time it's heads, half the time it's tails. If truth is there's no effect, 
then half the time you would expect to see a little effect that's positive, and half the time you would expect to see a little effect that's negative. And so if you turn this into, yeah, is it positive, is it negative, simple question, then you'd expect to see about half and half. Well, here what you see is everything's on the positive side, except for RC, which is the, the down at the bottom, which is exactly on one. And the probability of that happening can actually be calculated. It's one half to the sixth power, because there are six studies, um, and they're independent of each other. Um, and that's a very small number, 0.03 or something along those lines. So it's a 3% chance that you'd see everything on the right-hand side. That's a very unusual finding. What then is, in your opinion, the appropriate interpretation of this data? Well, I mean, you have to look at everything in interpreting all of this data. Uh, but when I look at everything I've seen in the EPI data, including this, the meta-analyses, the understanding of how the studies were done, the, the strengths and the weaknesses of all the studies, I see an association that's justified. There, there is an association between NHL and um, uh, glyphosate formulation exposure. Um, I can't call it causal. And in my opinion, it's just not strong enough for me to, to bring me there all by itself. Um, there's still potential for um, other things that could explain the results. I think the probability of those other things explaining the results is small, but I, I can't really rule it out. And so I'd say this is an association. It could be causal, but I can't absolutely say it's causal today with just this data. So if we go back to this, this stool of causation, um, if I understand it correctly, if we got rid of the animal studies and got rid of the mechanism studies and you just look at the epi, it wouldn't be enough for you. Is that right? To absolutely say this causes cancer in humans, um, it would not be enough. But that's not what we have here. That's correct. We do have all this data. That's correct. And when you look at all the data, sir, in your expert opinion, what does it show you? It shows me that glyphosate probably, uh, with fairly high probability, causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in humans.